Nate, and thank you. I think that should be our cue to start because uh, the team on this end is excited for this as well. So welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us at Canada's first ever summit on seniors transportation. I can't believe I'm saying that for all the events we have on the calendars throughout the years, there has not been a national summit on seniors transportation. So it's a pleasure to have you joining us from across Canada today. This event is a culmination of our Fast Track project. It's a project which many of you joining us today have personally been a part of over the past year. And I can't think of a better way to commemorate this work than being together with you. It's an honor to be your MC for the summit today. So my name is Nicole Perry. I'm the Director of National Programs at Health Age Canada. And when Health Age Canada, along with our partners at CanAge and O'Hara Aging and Accessibility, conceptualized this track project, we knew it was ambitious. And we wanted to hear from communities and organizations across the country to better understand the seniors' transportation landscape, the gaps and barriers that exist for seniors' mobility, and it's because of you that we're going to be able to fix that. You can't fix what you don't know. We wanted to identify innovative solutions and ideas that have potential to change the status quo. We wanted to improve transportation for our older citizens. And that's not just at home. We also wanted to look internationally uh, for this inspiration. So all of that is what we are here to share and celebrate today. You can think of this summit as the Oscars of Seniors Transportation. We are awarding, and you will have the chance to meet, six organizations in Canada who are doing innovative work in this field. So this event is about celebrating excellence, but most importantly, the real human impact that age-friendly transportation has for people. So for today's agenda, just like the Oscars, uh, we will begin, uh, we will be alternating award sessions with presentations. We're going to begin with a welcome message from Canada's uh, Minister for Seniors, uh, Kamal Kara. It'll be followed by opening remarks from the organizations who are leading Fast Track. We're then going to share our Fast Track project findings and have our first award session. We're planning a short break around 12.40 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And that break will be for about 10 minutes. The second half of the afternoon will include two more award sessions and a keynote presentation uh, from Phoenix Mobility Rising, who is one of the international innovators that we've connected with over the course of the project. In total, it will run for about three hours, and we hope that you can stay with us the entire time. So of course, we'll understand that you'll need to stand up, take stretch breaks, take health breaks. Please do as you need this. A couple housekeeping events uh, before we do get underway here. Uh, so we are recording this event. Now that we've started, uh, attendees, your microphones are muted, uh, but please engage with us in the chat. This is monitored. Likewise, to the left of the chat, uh, you can see a Q&A button. Please post all of your questions in this section. Um, this is going to be monitored as well, and we'll be drawing questions from this section uh, for our presenters. You'll have the chance to ask all our awardees and our keynote speakers questions, so uh, don't be shy. Use this feature of the webinar. And before we begin, I'd like to uh, share a land acknowledgement. Hardly any sector more than transportation ties you so closely to place. I'm speaking to you today from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. But this is a national event and we are each joining from different places. On behalf of the summit team and the Fast Track Project, I'd like to acknowledge that our work brings us to treaty lands and territories of numerous and diverse Indigenous nations to whom we pay respect. And I'd like to ask uh, everyone joining us today to take a moment of mindfulness and share in the chat the territories from which you are joining us. While doing that, uh, in a moment, we will begin with our uh, minister's welcome 
from Canada's uh, Minister for Seniors, Kamal Kara. Hello, everyone. Bonjour. Thank you for having me virtually at your national summit on seniors transportation. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining you from Ottawa, the ancestral, traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. We tend to think of accessibility in terms of getting in and out of buildings, but not always the ease of getting from one building to another, going for a grocery run, to a medical appointment or to a friend's house. Transportation is key to seniors' emotional and physical well-being. The pandemic has made transportation for seniors much more challenging. Many seniors suffered social isolation, loneliness, stress, and ageism. Others struggle to meet their basic needs, such as getting groceries. Our Age While at Home initiative and New Horizons for Seniors program are especially relevant for your discussion today. Both intersect with transportation and highlight its importance. Nobody can age while at home if they can't leave home. We will be launching the Age While at Home initiative in the coming weeks. This new initiative with a $90 million investment will help to provide practical support to seniors who want to continue living in their own homes. The program will connect seniors with volunteers who can help make meals, run errands, do yard work, cut grass, shovel snow, and yes, transport seniors to where they want or need to be. There's also our New Horizons for Seniors program with a purpose to invest in projects that help to improve the quality of life of seniors. It fosters the social inclusion and engagement of older Canadians in all aspects of society. Since 2004, the New Horizons for Seniors program has funded more than 33,500 projects in hundreds of communities across Canada, with a total federal investment of more than $720 million. As we continue to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, we must ensure that our programs and policies meet the needs of our aging populations. After a lifetime of hard work, Seniors deserve a secure and dignified retirement filled with family and friends and free of constant worry about life's necessities. Thank you for your work in ensuring that older adults have access to transportation options in their communities. Your work is helping the seniors of today and tomorrow feel empowered by fostering social inclusion in their communities. As I've said, the topic of your conversation today is crucial to organize this conversation as a national event and to bring together the voices of those who are on the ground and doing the work to share best practices is imperative. It will bring about successful innovation so that we can best serve the transportation needs of seniors in Canada. Have a great and rewarding summit and I look forward to receiving a summary of your event and Fast Track's upcoming report. Thank you, merci, Megvich. Thank you, Minister Kara, who could not be the, uh, with us in person today, but uh, was able to officially open and uh, welcome everyone to the summit and underscore the importance of the national conversation that we're having here today. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Gregory Sten, Executive Director of Health Age Canada, uh, the organization leading this project and who I'm proud to work for, uh, to welcome you also. Gregor, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Nicole. Hello, everyone. I'm I'm Gregor Snedden, the Executive Director of Health Page Canada, and I'm thrilled to be with you today to share the exciting work of our Seniors Transportation Initiative, Fast Track. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, Health Page Canada is an active national and international federal charitable organization in operation since 1975, and Canada's only national charity exclusively focused on older people. Our vision is a world in which all older persons will lead secure, healthy, active, and dignified lives. Our work and our strategic priorities in Canada continue to focus on addressing senior isolation, loneliness, and well being, especially among low income, marginalized, and underserved older people, in partnership 
with the Canadian community-based seniors services sector. And that's why the work of Fast Track, our flagship seniors transportation project is so important to us. You know, many older Canadians do not have access to transportation, period. There just is no available options that meet their most basic needs. Through a cross country call to communities, large and small, Fast Track has been seeking to identify the service gaps that limit how older people get around, as well as identify innovative solutions to fill those gaps. And that's what we're here to share with you uh, today. So why is this issue so important? Well, simply put, older people who are unable to travel suffer amplified isolation and loneliness, primary barriers to physical and mental health, as well as quality of life. Lack of appropriate transportation options is a critical concern for Canada's fastest growing demographic. I'm gonna leave it to my colleague, Laura, to share some of the hard hitting facts and figures about transportation and its impact on our older citizens. Now, we know that people live longer, healthier, happier lives at home. And we know the social and economic impact of allowing people to age at home in community. And naturally a society, a community for all ages includes the available means for all people to go to the doctor, to get their groceries, to visit friends and family, to volunteer, to stay, stay active. You know, an image that's always uh, haunted me was uh, one winter uh, late in the day, I was driving on a, a cold winter day in Centertown in a very economically challenged area where I uh, uh, operated a, uh, a drop-in center uh, in, in Centertown here in Ottawa. In the comfort of my warm car, you know, complaining about the road conditions and the inconvenience of traffic, when I passed an older person in a wheelchair, her giant tiger bag with some wrapping paper sticking out and a, a, a toy of some type in a box, probably for a, a grand uh, son or daughter that she'd been saving her pen pennies. And the look of defeat and discouragement on her face in this cold, miserable day, stuck in the slush and a six inch curb, tires spinning, still haunts me. You know, We have to do better. You know, transportation is a social determinant of health. To age in a healthy manner is dependent on accessing healthcare, community, quality relationships, nutritious food, activity, which all require your ability to access transportation options once you hang up the keys. This outlook on the role of transportation in healthy aging is not new to us or even others around the world. And you'll hear a similar approach from many leading international transportation innovators who will be showcased for you today. Ensuring accessible, age-friendly transportation in this country is a big challenge that cannot be tackled alone. And at HealthAge, we only work in one way and that's with partners, in partnership. And we had the privilege to partner with CanAge, and O'Hara Aging and Accessibility on this Fast Track project. It's also why today we are celebrating not only the Fast Track project findings, but the innovative transportation solutions and concepts that are in place or are being trialed by organizations across Canada. And these organizations and their teams are leaders bringing unique and tailored transportation options to their communities helping their oldest community members to age in place as they choose. The expression that says, we go further, faster, together, has never been more relevant than for this project and this issue. So thank you for being part of the collective, uh, moving this forward, and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to the Fast Track event today. Thank you, Gregor. I'm going to pick up um, on that important word that you underscored, partnership, and use that to uh, please introduce Lauren T Laura Tamblin Watts, CEO of CanAge, who is our important partner on the Fast Track project. Thanks very much, everyone, and I'm so pleased to be joining you from the West Coast today. And 
highlighting some of the important work that not just this project has done, but also really wanting to support the conversation in the chat where we're actively engaged. You are all here because of your leadership, and I want to celebrate that leadership. It's astonishing that we've never actually had a real pan-Canadian conversation about seniors transportation. And when we went back to this project, we wanted to ask, you know, why is that? Frankly, why is it that we are having such a challenge in addressing this issue? Many of us have been in meetings over the years where we get to this point and we say, oh, and transportation, yeah, that's a problem. And then we all kind of look like this and move on to something else. Tell me in the chat, has that ever happened to you? Is it that we have great programs and projects, but we get to that point where we talk about transportation, particularly outside of a major urban center, and we all are kind of uncomfortable because we know it is an issue. Tell me if this is something that you have wrestled with in your life. Bev and Stephanie say, yes, I'd love to hear from you more about whether you've had similar experiences. We decided to tackle it head on. I want to just take a few minutes and introduce not just CanAge, but why we are partnering on this important conversation today. You know, CanAge works and we are showing uh, the importance of how we are thinking about seniors and transportation. And by doing so, we have done a very rigorous policy review, which we call the Voices of Canada's Seniors. And I'm hoping that you'll be able to see this today. And so as we've gone through and identified some of the important issues of making Canada age inclusive, it's really important to not only know that we talked about transportation as an individual issue, but we also talked about it as a contextual issue. CanAge is a nonpartisan, not for profit organization. We have people across this country and BC, Alberta, Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, and until quite recently, Newfoundland were locations that we had core teams. We also have communities engaged. We've just launched a very rich one in BC called CanAge Communities BC and are going to be doing that across the country as well. We talk a lot about inclusion and participation, but we also talk about things like quality and openness, innovation and principled approaches. And as we're thinking about those values, we wanna wrap those into transportation as well. It's not good enough to have a possibility of transportation. It has to be quality. It's not good enough to be able to perhaps once a month or perhaps once a week, book something that could come within maybe a three hour window. That's not inclusion and participation. So as we are moving this conversation forward, we're doing so with our core values. And we work hand in hand. This is just a very few examples of how we work in Canada and globally, and what some of the issues and programs are big and small. I, this is my little plug. It's free to join. And so just go to canage.ca slash join. Unless we have your email, we're not allowed to reach out to you. So please do that. I want to share with you the six compass points on our roadmap very, very briefly, and then I'm going to focus in on transportation. But as I say, we take a vertical and horizontal approach. So we know that transportation is not just a specific issue, but it's a piece that we have to not just add on, but actually integrate into all of the other aspects of making Canada age inclusive as well. One of the big challenges, of course, that we've had over the time of the pandemic that we haven't spoken very much about at all is elder abuse and abuse prevention. Why am I talking about that with regards to transportation? Well, many of you would already know and have become expert over the many years you've worked together on the intersection of being able to move, having vulnerability, being dependent on transportation, and being able to either escape or get services and how the lack of transportation limits our choices. We know also 
that over the course of the pandemic, that one in six people who would experience abuse and neglect has elevated about 250%. And when we saw over the course of COVID-19, that one of the ways that often people got around through public transportation was limited because of public health measures. And so we saw transportation really get more focused and less accessible for people. We know that transportation is one of the social determinants of health, and yet we don't think about it as much, except for perhaps getting to and from health appointments. But we know that when we're looking at all of these aspects, transportation plays a role. If anyone's ever broken a leg or had an arm in a sling, you know that your transportation options, whether they be public transportation or whether they be private arrangements, is significantly challenged. Anyone who's ever been in a car and realized they can't drive just on a temporary basis will be able to tell you that they had a real shock to the system. And then we say, listen, it's not just that on a short term basis, but we need to think about this across mental health and substance abuse. We know that people have intersections and transportation is often a place of shelter. It's a place sometimes of refuge. And we know that people are using transportation to get to services that support substance abuse and mental health, um, either harm reduction or other forms of health and support. We know that people with cognitive impairment and dementia need additional supports in transportation, and that as we are having our aging population move more in the 80 plus range, that cognitive impairment is overwhelmingly common. In fact, about one in three people over 80 have some form of cognitive impairment. And it's got to be more than just yanking someone's driver's license. We need to think about how it's not just age friendly, but dementia friendly in our transportations as well. We know that when we're thinking about interjurisdictional issues, that transportation is a challenge, even if it's just a matter of bringing a car over a border from one province to the next, or whether it's actually transportation issues with insurance. If you want to, for instance, in, in uh, New Brunswick, go to Edmondsden on one side and then go across the Quebec border, that that adds additional challenges as well. So as we're thinking about these issues, the systems changes for optimal health and wellness, it's actually integrated in our thinking. And we need to make sure that transportation serves us across that entire life course. Infection prevention and disaster response, what does that have to do with transportation? Well, beyond just the idea of COVID-19 and limitations because of diseases, we know that people with different health issues have been limited by the types of transportation they've been able to use. Disaster response is incredibly important. Now, here I am in Whistler looking with weather eyes about whether or not this year will be a fire year again. And I'm looking to my colleagues in other parts, like the Northwest Territories or Manitoba, where flooding has already started. And so when we think about transportation, it's important to remember that the weather, and particularly extreme weather, plays an enormous issue. And as we see climate change playing more of a driving force for extreme weather, we have to realize that transportation can't be just a fair and sunny day type of experience. Anyone who's ever driven in the winter knows that there are additional challenges. But when we're thinking about people who are really going to be challenged by major disasters, and again, in British Columbia, we saw roads being cut off and entire downflows effects of entire areas, not just one city or village, but an entire chunks of the province being cut off last year by landslides and other events. So we need to really think about how transportation supports communities and how also we don't necessarily have transportation as part of our disaster response plans. Caregiving, long-term care, home care, and housing resources. What does that have to do with transportation? Well, if it's getting caregivers back and forth to people that they're caring for, that's going to be important. If we're thinking about how transportation is integrated into home care, whether we're looking at how people will live in certain houses and how those things relate to how they're going to get around, it's critically important. Just ask anybody in a rural community about how easy it is to get public transportation 
And I can tell you, many people are making decisions to come into the city where they may not have wanted to live because it may be the only option for transportation right now. And supporting aging in place is critically important. Transportation costs money. And as we are moving along with fixed incomes or deaccumulation, we know that we have to think about not just the individual cost of transportation, but also the social and infrastructure cost. And then you will see issue 37. So this is the very vertical point as well. We know that transportation or the lack of transportation is directly tied to loneliness and social exclusion. We know that technology, anyone who's ever used an Uber app has played a transformative role in transportation and scheduling. We know that our transportation systems are ageist, that we don't think about inclusion. We also understand that people with different backgrounds, particularly Indigenous seniors, may have other experiences with transportation, and we need to better understand what those roles are. So just to conclude, I want to give us a little bit of a, a real talk on this before we launch out. About 42% of senior non-drivers have reported unmet transportees in the last six months. 42% of senior non-drivers in the last six months. 37% of older adults experience social isolation due to the inability of accessing a ride. And we talked about rural and remote communities, but this statistic I think drives it home. About 58% of remote communities have primarily Indigenous populations facing disproportionate and distinctive transportation challenges for older adults. So we know that this is going to be an issue. That 15% of fewer trips to the doctor for people over 65 who don't drive, 59% of fewer trips to shop and eat for people who don't drive, and 65% of fewer trips to visit family and friends. I hope that this little overview has provided a bit of context to both the pressing needs, as well as why we need to make sure that we do a better job thinking about transportation, both vertically and horizontally. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Ashlyn. Ashlyn, are we moving on to the next piece? Hi there. Can you guys hear me okay? I, I was just waiting for, I thought Nicole was doing an introduction, <laughs> but I can move on. So one sec. I'm just going to give you it. accolades in a little bit, Ashlyn. Don't worry. No, no problem. I just was, I didn't want to share my screen just yet, but um, if you were going to talk. So I will share. We're good to go. So. My name is Ashlyn O'Hara, and I am with O'Hara Aging and Accessibility. And I'm going to be presenting to you today on behalf of our uh, Fast Track project team on all of our exciting updates. So let's dive in. Our beginnings, how did Fast Track even come about? So our seeds were planted with a philanthropic anonymous donor who's looking to make an impact on seniors' mobility across Canada over the next decade. And what happened was three organizations came together to determine how best to make that impact. So our project team was formed with these three organizations. We have HelpAge Canada, who is leading us in our Fast Track initiative. And then it is delivered in partnership with CanAge, uh, Canada's seniors, uh, National Seniors Advocacy Organization, who you just heard from, Laura Tamblin Watts, and myself with O'Hara Aging and Accessibility. So Fast Track stands for Funding Accelerator for Seniors Transportation. And what we are is we're really a national identifier for transportation. We know that many of you in this room today are working so hard to provide affordable and available solutions for seniors in your community. And we're here to empower that work and identify those in innovations and solutions in order to tackle this issue at a national scale. 
So a little bit of background. So while we know that we have been doing a lot of amazing work in this sector across the, the past decade, I've been working in transportation and specifically seniors and accessible transportation for the last 12 years. And we've definitely come a long way. However, there are some challenges to our current approach. Firstly, we have patchwork solutions. So what that means is that funding is often given at such a local specific level that we often end up with differences um, at, at, at even a community level. So you can drive down your street and you can have a senior on one side and a senior living on the other side. And the senior on the north side of the street gets access to XYZ programs while the senior on the other side of the street um, doesn't. So it, it's, it can be very patchwork. We also know that communities are siloed. So time and time again, I have communities approach me um, looking at how to start community transportation programs in their communities. And oftentimes they're looking at reinventing the wheel or doing something very similar that a neighboring community is doing. So how can we come together more collectively in order to yield results that have better impact? And lastly, we also know that there's a lack of expertise and support. Oftentimes, the dollars are handed out in grant programs, and uh, the communities that are rolling out uh, transportation programs are wearing many hats. The, the person, people on the call today, you guys know who you are, our amazing transportation coordinators, et cetera. Um, you're doing so many things and it's hard to know exactly how to operationalize uh, your program, how to maximize scheduling efficiencies, how to utilize technology in the best way. So we have to find a way to get those resources and expertise out into the community. So imagining what could happen if we tackled this issue together with national cohesion and our, our summit today all together is um, one of the first ways that we can do that and this is what Fast Track is all about. So we do have some specific objectives. Firstly, we're looking to define the problem. We want to obtain the first ever snapshot of seniors transportation gaps and barriers across Canada. We know that the data is lacking. What data we do have often exists in a provincial level level or scale and we're looking at how do we really get a handle on what's being offered across the country. And second, Secondly, we want to secure innovation. We're looking to identify solutions that are proven and ready to be replicated and scaled, and then pave the way forward by proposing recommendations on how to make the best impact across the sector over the next decade. So let's look into defining the problem, our first objective. You can't fix what you don't know. And we created a community profile submission form in order to capture a couple of things. Firstly, to determine the existing transportation options that are currently in place, and then what the gaps, barriers, and challenges are surrounding those solutions, as well as input on how we can move forward. How can we improve? Where are we getting stuck? What's the biggest roadblocks? And what are the ideas from you folks on how to improve that. So we received so far 124 in-depth submissions. For those of you on the call who completed a community profile form, you know how robust it is. We're not just asking a couple questions, we're asking really detailed information in order to truly capture uh, the nuances. And we heard from charities, nonprofits, seniors transportation providers, as well as public transportation agencies, private seniors transportation services, along with government staff, research groups, academic institutions, and transportation associations. So what did we learn? So far, the responses from our data have indicated that the industry is largely dominated by nonprofits at 45%, followed by public sector at 22%, and charities at 17%. So outside, and then a small uh, representation from the for-profit group. So outside of public transit, you can see that the vast majority is really being delivered by nonprofit and charity seniors transportation groups. 
And what's really interesting is that out of the 70 percent, um, or sorry, out of the, the nonprofit and charity providers, we know that 70 percent of these providers are relying on volunteers either wholly or in part in order to deliver further transportation solutions. Yet, only 63% report that their access to volunteers is scarce. So here we have a, a really big, identified a really big problem with our current seniors transportation delivery model. We have 70% of our largest providers were relying on volunteers, and yet almost 70% have very limited access in order to gain and maintain those volunteers. We also learned that um, in a very positive way, 71% of organizations have consulted and consult regularly with local seniors on their needs. So communities and organizations feel that they have a very good handle and a very good understanding of what seniors in their community need in terms of transportation. What happens is though they report several barriers to actually being able to meet those needs. So they know what to do or what needs to be done, but can't get it done. And why is that? That brings us to our top three barriers. Affordability, not surprisingly, is at 45% listed as the biggest barrier to seniors accessing transportation. And this isn't just, we heard, we heard this in two main ways. Firstly, we heard about affordability being affordable for the senior rider, right? So there was a big drive for um, people in communities for, that wanted us to create a seniors uh, transportation tax credit or a transportation benefit or some sort of transportation dollar program for low income seniors. So we heard about it in that area loud and clear. And then secondly, we also heard that uh, the seniors transportation programs themselves are also struggling in order to um, sustain their programs. Delivering door-to-door -door seniors transportation in the weather that we have in Canada and then layering on all the remote and rural communities, it's expensive. It's an expensive service to run. Um, and how can we get further together in that regard? Accessibility at 35%. Largely what we heard here was that in order to purchase a wheelchair accessible vehicle, it was extremely afford uh, extremely expensive. So there was affordability issues drawing us back to our first barrier. So just being able to purchase the vehicles as well as the ongoing maintenance, the training um, for staff regarding securements of mobility aids and devices was definitely a barrier. Also, just being able to have um, control or, or being able to help the senior in terms of even just getting to the vehicle, right? So there was a lot of accessibility. Accessibility isn't just within the vehicle itself. It's also that part of the senior's journey that involves coming from their door to the transit stop, to the vehicle, to the grocery store. Um, snow removal was a big one that we heard about as well there um, and the and accessibility of our built environment. And then availability was the last barrier and largely this was from a lot of agencies and communities and organizations that are in more rural communities, right? Just to, in order to access basic health care, some seniors were having to travel upwards of 360 kilometers in a round trip in order to be able to access the, the closest local health care to them. So not only does availability relate to um, health care, but it also related to food security, being able to access nutritious, healthy, fresh produce, uh, transportation availability was a huge barrier to that. And we did see a lot of our respondents um, pivoting during the pandemic. And instead of delivering trips, delivering groceries, delivering meals, things like that. And we'll, we'll actually going to hear about one of those in our award presentation. So next we're looking for innovation. 
So in order to really define innovation, we're looking at solutions that go beyond basic transportation approaches that are readily seen in the sector today. So we were looking for partnership innovations, which could involve public and private partnerships, looking at different, um, different funders coming to the table in order to uh, deliver something. Um, for example, we really want, we're looking to see the private sector come to the table here, right? So we know that transportation is being delivered largely by public and nonprofit space. How can the private sector get involved? And you'll see from some of our international innovative presentations today that they're able to get local businesses, grocery stores, et cetera, involved involved in um, senior transportation partnerships. Second, we're looking at policy innovations. A good example of this is the need for volunteer driver insurance. That's a huge barrier depending on what province you're in. If you are a volunteer driving your own vehicle uh, to, in order to deliver a trip for a senior, sometimes you're faced with um, specific insurance barriers. So developing policies around that um, would be something very innovative. And of course, technology. Technology innovations can help or hinder a transportation program in a big way. So for an example, we're looking at one-stop shop applications that allowed seniors to do everything in one place. So they could schedule, um, pay for trips, travel, um, and, and plan whether it was public transit or pre-booked in one way. And you'll hear about that again from some of our innovators. In order to find this innovation, we did two main things. We hosted our Transportation Innovative Awards, and we also did an international innovation scan. Um, I'm gonna talk to you more about the international innovation scan, but I do just want to um, give this background information on the award stream. So we have award presentations up right after me and throughout the entirety of the event today. We had two streams. Scale, scale Stream, <laughs> sorry, is an award for innovative solutions that are already in place and making an impact on the seniors transportation sector. While the test stream was awarding innovative ideas, so coming up with solutions and potential concepts um, that are feasible and would yield a significant impact for older adults, but weren't fully or, or completely implemented yet. So looking at our international innovation scan, we did a very robust uh, scan in partnership with the Samuel Center. And we narrowed it down to about 62 global innovators in seniors transportation. We do have a full report on this that we can share. We'll, we'll put that up on our website after the event. Um, but we really narrowed down to top three capstones. Uh, one is ITN America. Shout out to Catherine Freund, the executive director of that program. She is on the call today. Um, and Catherine will be featured in a video uh, that we'll be showing shortly. But really, this we, we could talk so much about what they're doing. But one of the key innovative takeaways is that they allow volunteers to drive um, and bank ride credits for future transportation needs. So I myself could be a volunteer driver and then I could donate my credits to my grandmother or a neighbor or a friend that needed transportation. Also seniors themselves that are still driving often volunteer and then save their ride credits in their bank, in their ride credit bank for the future. And again, there are so many things that they do, but that's just one spotlight. The Ride at 50 Plus program um, developed in partnership with the AARP and Toyota uh, featured a really interesting um, application where people were able to uh, basically book doing that whole technology piece, that whole mobility as a service where they could book, plan for, pay for, fully online, fully on an app. But what's also really innovative about this program is they still offered um, a, a call center where people and seniors could pick up the phone that weren't comfortable with technology and be able to call. 
And this uh, success, the real magic recipe of this Ride at 50 program, we feel came from an organization called Phoenix Mobility Rising, which helped got which helped to get this program off the ground by supporting it through technology and beyond. You're going to be hearing both from Kate and Valerie uh, later this afternoon um, from Phoenix Mobility Rising. And thirdly, we found Plus Bus from the Netherlands. And what's really innovative about this program is they were able to get over 99 buses in 100 different communities and municipalities across the Netherlands that are run by volunteer drivers. And really how they measure their success is combining social interactions or social engagements with trips, um, essential trips. So they would go to um, the museums. So they got the museums to fund one of the buses and they pick seniors up. They all get to go to the museum for this trip and engage and interact with each other and have a little lunch. And then on the way home, they did their groceries together. So that pairing of that social um, trip with the essential trip was really innovative. And across the board, when we looked at our our international findings, we really saw a magic recipe start to form. And there were four major pieces to this. So the first piece is national coordination. So the, what makes these international innovators uh, sustainable is that they have an overarching national entity that provides governance, structure, funding, toolkits, teaches um, the local levels on how to, how to implement, market, uh, and become fully self-sufficient. So having that national overarching entity with local flexibility was really important. The second was multi-sectoral funding. So in Canada, we are behind on this. We often just turn to the government or public sectors for funding. In other areas, the private sector is coming to the table. Uh, philanthropy is coming more to the table. We need to catch up on that. Thirdly, there there were secondary benefits, which included things that go beyond just transportation. So again, with Plus Bus, it would be the social inclusion piece, um, reduction in social isolation. And uh, for some of the others, it was environmental considerations and beyond. So it wasn't just about transportation going from point A to point B. There were more benefits, which helped attract more funders and keep things sustainable. And last but not least, technology. And I will say this carefully, affordable technology. It Community transportation programs cannot run successfully without um, the, an affordable technology background. Not that they can't, but in order to really scale and be um, sustainable, you need technology that's affordable, that's easy to learn, that doesn't require a lot of training, and that makes your service runs smoothly. And that's what all of these innovators were able to do was find a technology platform or build one in ITN's case that worked. So we will hear more from them, uh, but I did wanna just spotlight our magic recipe for a seniors transportation innovation. Lastly, we're going to be paving the way forward. So after today's summit, our next steps are to identify and categorize all of the opportunities that we found and make some very sound recommendations for future investment. We have a final report that will be coming out in June, so next month, and we are really excited to share that with you. So that concludes the Fast Track update. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lynn. I would be uh, remiss uh, in the spirit of partnership, one of our themes of this conference, if I uh, say thank you to you and acknowledge you as our in-house transportation expert for Fast Track. Uh, we were lucky to snag Ashlyn O'Hara uh, because she is one of Canada's leading accessible transportation experts. Uh, it was the best person who could have delivered that update to you today, everyone. Thanks again. So it is now the moment of our first award session of the summit. Uh, as it's a virtual event, we cannot physically give the transportation Oscar 
to our award recipients today, but we have brought them all uh, to you to share personally about their innovative conflict, uh, concept, pardon me, or solution. Innovation comes in many different forms. Ashlyn shared that with us. Uh, so just to reiterate, we were seeking solutions or ideas that went beyond the basic problem solving approaches readily seen in seniors transportation in Canada today. And particularly, we examine concepts and solutions in the areas of policy, partnership, and technology. Today, we're honoring six award winners, three in the test category and three in the stream category, uh, categories that Ashlyn described. The first two award recipients uh, that I'm pleased to announce today are in the scale category. What they have in common is that they have go gone above and beyond a typical on-demand transportation model to keep the safety and well-being of their community members at heart. York Regional Transit found their innovation amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. Southwest Nova Transit Association has embedded safety into their model from the onset. We are going to begin uh, by first welcoming and congratulating and hearing from Southwest Nova Transit Association. They are going to personally present uh, their concept to you, their solution to you uh, for about five minutes. Then we'll have a couple of minutes for Q&A. So please everyone put those questions in the chat and uh, we'll open the floor to Southwest. Congratulations, welcome, and thank you for sharing with us today. My name is Renata Tweedy, and I am the manager of Southwest Nova Transit. We are a very small charity in the rural area of Shelburne County, Nova Scotia. We offer a door-to-door -door transportation service uh, using two accessible vans and two sedans that are driven by our staff drivers. And we also have volunteer drivers who use their own vehicles and are reimbursed for mileage and expenses. Uh, we recognize that we are very blessed here in Nova Scotia because on top of having a lot of great municipal partners, our provincial government offers multiple funding programs for rural transit uh, to support research and development, to support sustainable operations and fare subsidies and vehicle acquisitions, all with the goal of seeing every part of our rural map covered by uh, nonprofit groups providing door-to-door, -door, pre booked wheelchair accessible service. And we're nearly there. We have 20 organizations in our network already. We've got two more in development. Uh, we're working right now on a customized province-wide dispatch system. Our managers have a great system of meetings and, and uh, private Facebook groups so that we're able to build those relationships. We can ask for help. We can share resources. It's very exciting times here uh, in Nova Scotia for our sector, for sure. Um, our specific organization, Southwest Nova Transit, uh, in September, we're going to be marking 10 years on the road. And... To be honest, we've spent a lot of those 10 years just broadening our understanding of what it means to be an accessible service and adapting to make sure we're able to help those that need us the most. So for example, uh, we learned pretty early on that wheelchair accessible vehicles are notoriously not very accessible for uh, non-wheelchair users because they're, they can be really hard to get in and out of. So we started adding sedans to our fleet. Um, so we'd have some flexibility. We started keeping detailed notes on some of our riders so we could make sure we were matching them with vehicles that would be safest for them. Uh, and if someone ever needs more assistance than we're able to provide safely, then attendants always ride free. Um, when we realized that there was a huge need for people to travel long distances to access medical care, um, for our riders, you know, it's as much as six hours round trip, sometimes for a 10 minute appointment at eight in the morning, uh, we began helping riders to advocate for themselves. We began offering to make calls on their behalf to request later appointment times, to request satellite clinics or telehealth options or, or local referrals when they were possible. Um, and for times when it wasn't possible and we were seeing that you know, this, the financial strain was pretty significant for people, especially those that had to travel regularly for those long distances. We started arming ourselves with the knowledge of more formal funding programs for transportation that we could help people apply for. And 
we started focusing our grant writing and our fundraising on subsidies so that we're able to offer tens of thousands of dollars worth of fare reductions every year. And when we realized that some of our riders required more comprehensive solutions beyond just transportation, uh, we started to educate ourselves about what was available. We started building relationships with organizations and uh, service providers and social workers so that when it was appropriate, we could help to make those connections. So those are just some of the ways that our service has evolved over the years to become more truly accessible to older adults and to other people living in Shelburne County. Uh, we still have a lot to learn. <laughs> um, but as we continue to learn and to grow and to evolve, we can celebrate and we do celebrate because we know we have riders who have been able to stay in their homes longer because of us, because we can help them get to their errands and to their appointments. Uh, we have riders who have been able to maintain their independence because of us, because they can get to where they need to go when they want to get there. They don't always have to rely on friends and neighbors. Um, through the relationships that are built with our drivers and dispatch team, uh, we've helped to be able to reduce feelings of isolation that some of our older riders have been feeling, especially during the pandemic. And of course, you know, we've been able to help riders access life-sustaining and life-saving medical care. And I thought that I got it. I thought that I understood how important all of this was. I mean, I've been with this organization for 11 years. I should get it. But it wasn't until my mother, who uh, is elderly, who lives several provinces away in a tiny little town, she received a cancer diagnosis during the first year of the pandemic. And I couldn't be there to help her. I couldn't be there to help her get to her appointments. But 20 minutes away, there is a seniors organization that has a volunteer driver program under their umbrella. And so throughout my mom's cancer journey, which thankfully has led to a remission, I learned from the other side of things how important it is to have a dispatch team who is easy to reach and communicates clearly what to expect. I learned how important it can be for somebody who is going through scary tests and treatment to be able to build those relationships with drivers, to be able to request their favorite driver. And I learned the true relief of a caregiver, uh, especially a remote caregiver like I was, to have a trustworthy and affordable solution to a much such an important piece of the larger puzzle. So I am very proud to be a part of this vital sector that is spread across the country that's helping so many people, young and old, to be able to access the services and the opportunities they need to live healthier, more connected lives. And on behalf of my organization, uh, we're very thankful to the Fast Track team for this recognition and for this opportunity to speak with you all today. Great. Thank you, Renata. I was uh, all prepared to uh, position some virtual magic as you uh, record in advance your message for us, but you coordinated your outfit. I thought I was going to have to explain the, the change in outfit. Well done. Um, you, are, you are so humble. Uh, thank you for sharing your personal journey with us. Thank you for sharing the journey of uh, Southwest with us. Uh, we are all learning and all seeking to improve uh, the services and support we provide our communities. On Thane, we've had a question come in, and if it's all right with you, Renata, I'll, I'll just begin with it. Um, you know, you mentioned on your mother's journey, one of the local community senior organizations, they have volunteer uh, transportation driver, and uh, the question that has come in is about those local community organizations. How do they fit in? Maybe you can elaborate on how you coordinate with local, uh, local senior centers as part of your broader association. So the broader association, meaning the, the 20 organizations. Yes. Yeah. How do you coordinate everyone is really the question. Um, well, I, at this point, there's not a lot of coordination in terms of, of working together. Um, so I think our organization is one of the only ones that actually relies on the neighbors to 
each side, um, especially during the pandemic, we were really, our capacity was really cut because we stopped traveling people together. So we were just kind of doing one-on-one -on -one trips to try to, you know, keep people from spreading COVID to each other. And so that really, you know, cut our capacity down. And so we were constantly calling Queens County Transit or Hope Dial a Ride on either side and saying, can you pick up a return trip for us. We uh, developed a partnership with a, a taxi um, in a neighboring city to say, can can we start, you know, subcontracting you to complete some trips that we can't. We actually got a grant for our local community health board just to cover that subcontract piece. Um, but in terms of coordination going forward, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, the province of Nova Scotia is uh, funding a province-wide dispatch system, which will eventually have uh, some capability for us to be able to do tagging uh, so that those of us on one end of the province, if we're headed through, we can pick up riders along the way. So we're, we're really excited to see how that's going to play out. Thank you. And uh, a follow-up question that just dovetails so nicely is around uh, provincial subsidies that are offered for transportation services. How uh, how important are these? How reliant are your is your center organizations on on these provincial subsidies? Well, let me tell you a very small story. I can remember being in um, an association meeting at the associations called RTA, Rural Transportation Association. Um, and I can remember being in a meeting a few years back when our provincial representative came in and gave us a raise. And I cried. And I called him Santa for a really long time because it the, to see the way that the province has consistently um, been recognizing the importance of transit um, and the funding package for our organizations continues to grow. Um, so it is, it's vital. I don't know how we would do it otherwise because transportation is expensive. We all know that. I mean, gas prices right now are, yeah. So having that core funding available for us um, makes it possible to do what we do. Thank you. Um, Renata, I, I wish we could have more time for, for questions, but um, I'm going to introduce our, our next um, awardee in a moment. But what I'd like to say is if you're comfortable, please feel share, free to share your contact information in the chat. Uh, for attendees who may have further questions for uh, Renata, please feel free to uh, take that conversation to the chat. This event is about Make Connections. And uh, Renata, congratulations again for all of your work. And thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Wonderful. So I did, uh, I, I did spill the beans on our second awardee in my introductions. It is York Regional Transit, uh, who, uh, who is receiving a scale award. And we have Sharon Doyle, who is uh, here to present half of them. Sharon, welcome to the event and the floor is yours. And I just wanna make sure we have uh, Sharon's audio. I see that we have Sharon on the line. It just might take a moment. Um, we'll just let our tech group uh, make sure that they can uh, turn on her video and spotlight her for you guys. Um, it might be that she joined, that her link was, wasn't a panelist link potentially, um, but this just happened. So I just want to confirm that everyone can see uh, York Region Transit in on the screen. Okay, perfect. And I'll just go through um, in case there's any other questions in the chat. I know um, there was a lot of uh, questions about, do all provinces outside of Ontario have provincial gas tax programs dedicated to transportation? So I wonder if you guys can maybe answer that in the chat, it, uh, where the province where you're from. Um, perhaps uh, Bev from United Way can answer for BC and, uh, We'll see if Alberta and other areas have a gas tax, a gas tax program. I'm seeing answers already, Ashlyn, not in New Brunswick. Yes, yes. In Renfrew County. 
I was just in BC last week and uh, I have to say that it's uh, the, the gas prices were shocking there, higher than in, in Ontario. And that's the first thing that came to mind was the ability of the great work being done across Canada. I see we have Sharon with us though, so I'm going to uh, turn it over to Sharon. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, can you hear me now? Good, that's perfect, thank you. And, and thank you again for the recognition and this opportunity to speak with you today about a service we implemented during the pandemic and, and hopefully will continue to provide post COVID-19. And for those of you, um, and, and, and I wanna thank Ashlyn cause she's, she's, she is pushing the buttons on my presentation today. So if we could go to the, thanks, thanks Ashlyn. For those of you who are not familiar with York region, the region itself covers almost 1800 square kilometers and is indicated by the blue area on this greater Toronto transit map. Next please Ashlyn. And York region itself is made up of nine local municipalities with a population of 1.2 million citizens. 60% of the population is in the urban areas and lives in the south, south which borders with the city of Toronto and the other 40% is of course rural. And now I thought these statistics um, extracted from the 2021 census were important to the conversations we are having regarding seniors transportation. And although these, they, they are York region specific, I have no doubt that other communities are seeing the same trends. So what do we do about providing vital, independent, inclusive and spontaneous services to our entire population? Next please, Ashley. For the next few minutes, I will share York Region Transit's vision and approach to providing integrated mobility. We believe our vision improves a citizen's quality of life. And that's always been very important to um, us at York Region Transit. And I think you'll see that as we continue this presentation, uh, how we've tried to do things maybe a little differently um, I can tell you that uh, uh, people have asked me, is, is it easy? No, it's not easy, but um, it was absolutely, absolutely worth it. And we have a very, very supportive council, regional council that, um, that has looked at this and said, yes, you know what, this makes sense, go for it and we'll, we'll see where it takes us. So it all began with with the family of services concept that includes 60 foot articulated buses, two sedans, all branded in York Region Transit colors, all accessible and all capable of picking up any passenger. Journey planning is determined by the ability of the passenger. And there were many naysayers when we started our journey, but they were soon silenced when they saw our success. And much of that success can be attributed to our travel training program. If the, if the service is not familiar to a passenger or that passenger has questions, a one-on-one -on -one travel training session is made available to them. We built a travel training center that has a bus, ferry equipment, iPads, so passengers could familiarize themselves on their own time and didn't feel pressured out on the road. We have found that number one obstacle for our seniors is really their own apprehension, and we knew we could help them conquer that. So we continued our vision by having what was once just paratransit services now provide an on-demand, spontaneous same-day trip to any passenger, who lived in areas where a bigger bus was no longer warranted or there was no transit at all. Para, paratransit passengers now didn't have to call us two or three days or seven days ahead to get a trip. They were guaranteed a same day trip. And that was, and that was huge in the industry. Uh, and, and it came with, you know, it was scary at times, but um, it's been, it was successful before the pandemic and and uh, we expect to expand upon it once all of this is over for all of us. So what we did was we commingled our services and uh, paratransit and conventional, but there was still a group who we always felt had slipped between the cracks. And 
the pandem pandemic gave us an opportunity to address it. And seniors who were over the age of 65 but did not qualify for paratransit services still had transportation needs. And many just wanted to go short distances to pick up medication or food or get to a medical appointment, but were apprehensive to get on a larger bus with other people. All that they were hearing through the media was that they were the most vulnerable to this virus and it was important they took precautions. We had the vehicles available and the drivers wanted to continue to work. So we introduced a door-to-door -door service for those over 65 to go to any location less than five kilometers away in a smaller vehicle. In addition, we provided service to vaccine clinics and waited for the passenger to, so they could return home because we knew that the clinics didn't want to have people waiting around. Since the implementation in July 2020, we have provided close to 4,000 trips on the MOR 65 plus service. We hope that this has become just another service we provide to our residents and one that they can call upon in the months and years ahead. It addresses their need for safe, reliable and affordable transportation. So again, I thank you for this opportunity. And if you have any questions, please contact me by email because collaboration is so important and let's keep the lines of communication open. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, for sharing that personally. Um, with all the difficult news we heard over the years with COVID-19, it was so remarkable to um, something good come out of it, a, a new service and innovation that you were able to share with us today. The question that I have for you is to, um, you know, understand, is this a model that you would recommend to other paratransit providers across Canada? It is unique, forged in the time of COVID. Why or why not would you recommend it? Well, as Ashley mentioned earlier, the service is very expensive. And I think it, it, it and, you know, in years gone by, you just, you're so concerned about about those costs and the budget and, and, and just providing services um, to those that you are meant to provide service to um, through your mandate. But, you know, this, I, it, we always felt that this was a group, this 65 plus group who, who didn't have any, that didn't have, weren't able to take paratransit because they didn't qualify or maybe they didn't even want to. Um, but just wanted to get that few kilometers to wherever they needed to go. And we thought, how difficult could this be? How costly could it be? And how much of an uptake would it, take, would it be, would there be? And we have, we have found, um, of course, it's, co it, you know, it's pandemic time and, and our, our vehicles are not as busy, but we'll gear up for that now. And it, it because it's so worth it. And to hear, to hear the, uh, just the feedback from those passengers and I didn't know how I was going to get out and you know my daughter brings my groceries but I didn't know how I was going to go and get to the doctors and just you know those few which we take for granted and um we are now able to provide that it makes you know it makes us <laughs> maybe it's because I'm getting to be oh well I am that age <laughs> so and I, but you know, that's always been, I've been with York Region Transit now for 23 years. And it really has always been our vision to be more inclusive and to give people the independence they, they deserve. And I, I really have a tough time um, distinguishing between a paratransit customer and a, and a conventional customer. They're a passenger. They're a passenger, they deserve the same service, they deserve um, the same opportunities, the same spontaneity, um, and the same inclusiveness. And so this just made sense. And I, so I think it's a very worthwhile endeavor and I would encourage other transit properties across the country just to get over the first hurdle. Don't worry about getting to the end hurdle, get over the first one and just see if you can uh, put something in place that would, that will help your citizens. Thank you, Sharon. I think that that call to action and that, that parting sentiment is 
the perfect one to uh, cap what you're sharing with us today. I've seen one or two questions floating in, and um, if you can take a few minutes, Sharon, to address those in the chat, uh, that would be wonderful uh, because we will uh, move forward in, in our summit today. But uh, as you said, to keep conversation going, I know your contact information uh, was in your presentation and folks can be in touch. Sure, thank, thank you, Nicole. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So again, congratulations and thank you to our first two awardees. The others are coming up in the second half of our summit, uh, but we're actually about the halfway point. So a little like a baseball game, I'm gonna suggest you know a seventh inning stretch to everyone, uh, stand up and get out of your chairs. For the next section of our summit, we're going to share um, a video that we've created it showcases some of our international innovators, um, the ones that Ashton spoke to earlier that we think really can inspire the work we're doing in Canada. It'll actually set the floor for our speaker coming up at this. Um, so I'm going to uh, have that start now, encourage everyone, as I said, to stand up and stretch and more to come after our video. Hello, my name is Catherine Freund and I'm the founder and executive director of ITN America, which is the first and only national nonprofit transportation network for older adults and people with special needs in the United States. We've delivered more than 1.4 million rides. Our drivers are volunteers and paid drivers uh, and they help people uh, door through door and arm through arm. It's a community based nonprofit solution. We use automobiles. We take people where they want to go, uh, when they want to go. We built our own software for the service called ITN Rides. Um, and it's unusual software for a couple of reasons. One is it, it has a research database under it with 178 fields of data. And this helps us um, understand who the riders are and where they go and what they do so we, we can help them. Um, everybody signs an informed consent and we use the information uh, for research and, and to study transportation. Um, we also have something called a personal transportation account, um, which holds transportation assets in different forms. The service is community based and community supported because it's not just the older adults who benefit, their adult children benefit, healthcare providers benefit, supermarkets benefit. Uh, so we have programs that allow those that benefit to help pay for the rides and it's built right into the software so that any community that uses the software can benefit from all of the different marketing programs. I mean, we, we knew this was a national problem when we started working on it. So we tried to pay attention to things that could be replicated in different communities and supported by the software. So supermarkets can participate in Ride and Shop, uh, healthcare providers can participate in Healthy Miles, um, or they can participate in something called Ride Services, where they can actually just pay for the ride for someone to get to the office. Um, there's also innovative payment plans where volunteers who drive others now can store credit for that uh, social capital, if you will, and then when they are older, someone else can drive them and they can pay with their credits. Or uh, a family member, say, living in uh, Medicine Hat uh, can uh, volunteer and then some their parent living in Nova Scotia can pull that credit out in Nova Scotia. We do this here in the US and, and it works beautifully. Um, now we are moving to the cloud with a program called ITN Country. Uh, and that is on the Salesforce platform, which is just a 
wonderful, strong platform that supports human relationships and nonprofit community-based transportation is nothing if it isn't about human relationships and people reaching out to each other and helping each other. All of our routing algorithms have been donated uh, and so the software uh, is specially designed for community-based transportation and very, very affordable. Phoenix Mobility Rising is a nonprofit organization that was started in March of 2018. Our mission is mobility solutions for the health and well being of every person in every community. So, the way we start out is we come in and we're learning. We hire a local person in the communities where we do work, someone with deep roots in the community who does know um, all of those special things that, that make the community unique and that affect the transportation landscape. We put the community members in the driver's seat. For us, it's much more about tailoring what we offer to the needs of, of the community. First and foremost, Phoenix is important because transportation is an underserved need. We know that all across Canada, many communities um, currently lack inner city and regional transportation and, and rural areas have even fewer resources. When you think about transportation in a new frame, and, and this is how we often communicate about transportation now, Transportation is food. Transportation is medicine. Transportation is mental health. Transportation is employment. And so when you think of all the critical needs that individuals have and how intricately linked with transportation they are and the fact that it's an underserved need, that's why Phoenix <laughs> and others working in the mobility space are important. We've traveled over 270,000 miles. We've served almost 3,000 individuals and done over 21,000 trips, about half of those for, for medical purposes. And so you can imagine the impact is, is big. It's inspiring to others who, who want to get on this train and do the same thing. And I hope we can you know, see a lot of change in the mobility space. And, and I think we will. I think this is just the very beginning, really. I'm Eva Sidrakis from the National Foundation for the Elderly. The National Foundation for the Elderly is a charity that promotes quality of life for older adults in the Netherlands, focusing on social inclusion and active aging. The Plus Bus was founded in 2006, and the core business of the Plus Bus is to organize cultural and social activities for older adults that are not mobile anymore and can't go out by themselves. Everybody above 55 can use it. And also volunteers are most of the time elderly people themselves as well. What I would like to highlight is that the National Foundation for the Elderly helps mostly throughout the first year. So we purchase the bus, we help for maintenance of the bus. I would really like to stress that a lot is done locally and that we are very happy for that. A lot has been done by local volunteers, coordinators of the Plus Bus. They a fund raised for the next years and a bus normally on average drives around for and on average for like eight years so that's quite long which makes it also very sustainable to invest in it for a municipality or a local organization so a lot is done locally and i think that's one of the strengths of the plus bus for example a local supermarket can fund the plus bus and then the participants go together with the bus to the supermarket it's also an, a whole economic part that is sustainable for the local community it gives people a reason to go out have a nice day meet other people even when they don't know a lot of people because you can just come by yourself if you like and it also gives a sense of meaning for older adults that are mobile, but have a, want to do something during their daily life. So they volunteer, for example. And there we spoke to people that of, of a local plus bus, and they say like, when I go on a, on a trip with the plus bus, we feel like we went on a holiday, but when we come back, uh, I'm alone and I have no one to share my stories with. So now we're actually looking at like, how can we connect people uh, be after or in front of the, before the trip as well, maybe on a website or a plat platform where they can share pictures of uh, share their stories, 
connect with people. It's very nice to see that even the plus plus is just a start. It can create more con friendships and connections as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you to our IT team for uh, sharing that video with us and thank you uh, to our international innovators, who uh, many of whom are here today. Uh, you inspire the work that we can do in Canada. Thank you. So with that, I'm going to move us along to the next section of, uh, of the summit where we will meet one of the innovators uh, that was just showcased in the video. I have had the privilege of hearing the origin story of Phoenix Mobility Rising firsthand. This group is a unique nonprofit organization that believes that transportation matters and that it matters deeply. They bring a solutions approach that is tailored to the communities they work in to eliminate transportation inequities. They're grounded in mobility as a service, uh, but Phoenix Mobility Rising offers so much more than that to the communities they work in. In a short few years, they found tremendous success, particularly supporting rural and remote communities to implement transportation solutions. Here to share the success of their model firsthand is Executive Director of Phoenix Mobility Rising, Valerie Lafleur, and Kate Scram, Director of Projects and Partnerships, also with the charity. Welcome to you both. The floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. And it's just so inspiring to hear the stories of the award winners and the incredible work that they do. So we're honored to be a part of this. And thank you. All right, Kate, do you want to share the screen and we will get this party started? Absolutely. All right, so Phoenix Mobility Rising was founded in 2018, and we are on a global mission to reduce the impacts of transport poverty in communities. Uh, so currently in the past nine states, we, um, we have deployed pro we deployed programs in nine states and we have several communities that we're also looking at expanding into this year, but we really believe about this ecosystem approach. As several of the award winners brought examples, it was about ecosystems, it's about multimodal, it's about community. And so we at Phoenix, we don't um, have a priority to provide every ride. We want to make sure that every ride it's needed in a community happens. And so that's why we say in our mission, we provide transportation solutions for the health and well-being of every person in every community. Next slide. And so we've done a number of different pilots um, across the United States. We've done pilots with health insurance companies. This is an example where we partnered with an insurance company and provided free public transportation in a, one of the um, most impoverished counties in the United States. Um, we've deployed statewide systems. Um, we have a partnership with a nonprofit called Neighbor Network of Northern Nevada, and we're deploying technology connecting all the public and human services and private transportation providers in one technology um, system across the entire state. We've also done programs that support employment. So focusing on creating innovative employment solutions in Wisconsin, we've worked with the public transit, the Department of Economic Development, we've deployed volunteer drivers, we work with taxi companies, and together we support refugees, re-entering citizens, um, single parent households who are really trying to access those high wage earning jobs that are out of reach um, from their current transportation. Um, we've also deployed technology in the state of Michigan with a paratransit provider that is fully accessible for screen readers and for um, accessible for paratransit needs. And so not only have we focused on serving those who have disabilities, but also making sure that soup to nuts, the technology is built to serve them. In many cases, the apps that are deployed in transportation do not take into the unique account of individuals who use screen readers. And 
Coming up next, we've also deployed training. So one of the projects that we worked on, we had the opportunity to create disability awareness training for professionals in transportation. So a lot of times where individuals are working in the transportation industry and drivers are hired, there's a lot of training that goes into it, but understanding and feeling prepared to support individuals with disabilities is definitely a big part of that educational process. And when we did uh, research with transit agency partners, there, that element was missing in some of the curriculum that was, was out there. They knew how to deal with bloodboard pathogen, pathogens, they knew how to secure wheelchairs, but when it came to understanding and helping somebody in and out of the car or in and out of the bus with a service animal or appreciating the nuances that somebody's wheelchair is, you treat as if it's part of their body. And so those, there's just nuances that came with that that we provided. Um, we've also partnered with major automotive manufacturers and deployed non-emergency medical transportation. So in some communities that we were serving in a rural area, there was no service. The public transit was providing um, some service that was available, but it didn't meet the needs for health care, for chronic care and needing those rides same day or next day. And finally, we've also done pilots specifically just focusing on our veterans. We know that um, veteran transportation is very fragmented and in particular in the United States, it's very, very disjointed. And we really wanted to work on a program that supported specifically veterans, but a lot of the initiatives that are funded at the federal level have lots of layers of, of red tape and, and you have to have certain requirements in order to meet that. And so we said, well, let's find a community where we can deploy an innovative model with an ecosystem approach to break down these mobility barriers for veterans. And so all across the United States, we've done these pilots and so many more, including supporting the AARP Ride at 50 Plus program to really say, how do we, how do we work in a community? How do we work together? How do we support the solutions that are already there? How do we build bridges and, and build new ones? And so with all of that knowledge and our team's insight, uh, we started out and we created a new program called Ignite. That isn't just about mobility, it's about health equity. And when you start talking about health equity and framing transportation in that lens, a lot more, as we found, philanthropic um, energy comes to the table. A lot more of the healthcare community becomes engaged because then it's about understanding how mobility impacts the difference between getting from point A to point B and how that impacts their bottom line, but also how it impacts us from a social equity perspective. And we know that transportation is an intersectional resource to improving public health. On the left is a picture of a family in the coastal bend of te Texas. And in this particular community, um, it's outside of Corpus Christi, Texas, and um, there's arsenic that is contaminated in the water. There's about 30,000 residents that live around this area and the water isn't safe to drink. You can bathe in it, but it will turn your hair white and the, um, there's bacteria in the water, so they can't drink the water in their home. And they can't cook with the water in their home. They can't bathe with the water in their home. And the woman was sharing with us how, you know, she could only bring two bags on the bus. Well, she has three children that she's caring for and supporting on weekends. And so she's like, just trying to get enough water in my house for my, my children and I to drink, let alone cook and bathe, is a Herculean effort. And I need to go places in cases where, you know, like to the laundry mat and I, I the public transit won't let me take my laundry baskets on the on the bus. And so we we had to figure out once you start solving these transportation issues, other things begin to address and we need an entire community to work together. On the right is a picture of a house in one of the um, communities we support in Mississippi where during the ride, the um, mother was going for a prenatal appointment. She was nine months pregnant and she said, you know, I really keep on getting headaches. I know my house isn't safe. I've got black mold growing in my home, but I don't know what to do. And so our volunteer driver was, you know, hey, we're, we're, uh, you're not going to take that baby home to a house that has black mold in it. We're going to do better. And so we then talked to the state officials. We talked to the housing authority and we talked to different resources and we were able to help that mother get access to a clean, fresh apartment that did not have black mold. So her and her children and her new baby could come home from the hospital in a clean environment. And so transportation 
is that network of a fiber of a community where as in that bus and in that vehicle, so many times these conversations lead to so many bigger things. So that's why we wanted to make sure that in this new model, the community was a part of the conversation. Keep going. So Phoenix Ignite really comes together to solve this challenge where coordination and connectivities of services create health disparities and systemic barriers. And so we know that um, individuals and families, you know, you don't live in a vacuum, you don't live in a zip code, you need access to all social determinants of health to thrive, like the fact that there are, you know, jobs, where's the grocery store, that particular community in Holmes County, there are 14,000 folks that live there. It's about 800 square miles. And there are only two grocery stores that serve fresh produce, but almost 200 gas stations. So, so many families are relying on the corner gas station for sustenance for their family and unable to access fresh produce. And we know that mobility is a universal need and that transportation is essential for health equity. And so Phoenix is about creating creating a um, seamless system of care with the Ignite model, where it's about collective impact. It's not about a quick shot in the arm and everything will be better. It's about working together over the long haul to make a difference, to change how the, how the community uh, works together and addresses their transportation barriers. Um, it's about deploying mobility as a service. It's about an ecosystem. That public transit is vital. Those volunteer drivers are vital. Those small businesses, those taxis are also an important part of the ecosystem. And so together we rely on each other to fill the gaps for jobs and healthcare and seeing loved ones. And creating this network of resources. So this goes back to in a community, yes, you may be able to, um, you know, provide the ride, but during that ride, all of these conversations start happening. And then there's how do I get my prescriptions? How do I get my groceries? How these things? And we all have to work together in this model to be successful. And because mobility is expensive, and as amen, the gas prices keep rising, the justification for the investment in transportation is, is pivotal, and data is a part of that. And that's, I mean, I think it's incredible that ITN America has 178 data fields underneath their technology that collects that information, because that's exactly one of the barriers that happens in so many communities is you're making a difference. You spend so much time and energy to get that to happen, but then that, that element of, well, what kind of difference are you making? What's the impact is so hard to to, to do at the, at the back end. It's gotta be done from the very beginning and moving forward. And so there are eight components to, or sorry, six components. Ugh, you can tell I'm a little nervous. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Kate to get started and share about the first three. First three. All right, so when we're talking about um, creating this collective impact model and the importance of how transportation intersects all social determinants of health, we also often say we go into a community and we really want to make sure that we're attacking that community's challenges and serving their needs and being highly customizable. But we don't just throw spaghetti at the wall. Well, sometimes we might, but we do have components that we have now learned through all of the pilots that we've done and all the work we've done um, in different communities that are a part of this transportation solution. So when you look at these components, I don't want anyone to think of this as a timeline where you implement this first one and then go on to the next and on to the next. These are really just puzzle pieces that are put together, um, sometimes one piece of the puzzle is a little bigger than another piece. And we figure that out with the community leaders as we're going. So in the community engagement piece, we're really talking about um, the work that is being done in the community already and what we need to add to supplement groups working on different social determinant of health areas. So in some communities that we go into, there are groups that are really, really closely examining what food insecurity looks like in that community. And they have excellent food pantries and uh, meal programs, food delivery services. In that case, Phoenix says, yay, let us be one of your cheerleaders and please just join us in this conversation about what you're already doing and how we can coordinate that with the other social determinants of health and with transportation. Um, in some cases, we'll go into a community and they're like, we really need to examine employment, but they don't have anything set up yet to do that. So we'll help form that group. So part of how we organize this, we call them action teams. 
So we would ensure that there is an action team already existing or that we help form with leaders working in that area, whether it's food insecurity, health, housing and utilities, employment, or, or any of the others, and of course, transportation as one of them. And then all of those together make up what we call the community leadership circle. So action teams are a little bit smaller working groups, really digging in, and they would meet monthly um, is the typical cadence. And then the community leadership circle is when we bring all of those action teams together uh, to really add their, their impact in um, about quarterly is how they would meet typically. So when we talk about outreach and staffing, um, that is Phoenix staffing, partner staffing, and then how do we get the word out about this? So we've discovered that one of the keys um, to this is to have a local person. Each community, sure, has about, you know, 85% similarities, um, but there's that 15% that is really unique to how that community operates, what the local politics are like, who the movers and shakers are, and, and what's been tried, what works, what doesn't. And it's really great to have that local insight. That comes from the partners that we work with in the community, but it also comes from hiring someone from within the community to be on our team, leading the project forward. We call that a community development manager or a community resource coordinator. And then the other thing is, if we're going to start a big movement in transportation and start tackling challenges in, tra in transportation and other social determinants of health, we know that we've got to get the word out. The worst thing that you could have happen is to have this fantastic program going on and repeatedly you still hear, oh, well, I need a ride, but there's no, there's no resources in my community. Oh, <laughs> that hurts, right? When you put so much work into something and you, and you have this excellent resource in a community. So the outreach um, from our perspective is extremely important. And we don't just mean, you know, throwing a couple of Facebook announcements out there. That's part of the puzzle, of course. But we have to figure out how people get their information and really dig in. So we've done stuff as creative as sending a little note with every person's water bill. Because in one of the communities we, where we were, it's very rural. Everyone still gets a postcard that has their water bill. And so we added a note to that to ensure everyone heard about what we were doing. Sometimes it's radio ads and everyone listens to the same uh, couple radio stations in, in a rural community. And so we do a radio ad. Just work with the local um, community and the local program sponsors to figure out what our outreach campaign can look like. And then we have capacity building. So when we talk about capacity building, this is both in the transportation ecosystem and then in helping support the rest of the social determinants of health. So we are not saying that we are the heroes of the food uh, insecurity challenge when we go into a community. Our expertise is transportation. But we do want to make sure that we identify how we can work together as a group to ensure that everybody has the resources that they need. So we'll focus on the transportation piece first. In a community, as Valerie had said before, Phoenix does not feel the need to provide every ride. Um, we, in fact, we really don't want to <laughs> in most cases because that means that the local community is is really hurting for resources. We'd rather be there to fill gaps um, because if we can just fill in the gaps and help support what's already there, then we create these you know, win-win scenarios and we really like that. So we have a comprehensive volunteer driver program um, called the Phoenix Volunteer Force. And that includes everything from the outreach for recruiting volunteers to tr uh, training the volunteers, onboarding the volunteers, ongoing management and technology support with the volunteers and um, incentives, rewards, you know, a fun community to be part of and on all of that. And then we also do help set up paid driver programs when that's needed, including um, if non-emergency medical transportation services are really lacking in an area. So when we set up our um, staffed transportation, 
In most cases, we're talking about certified non-emergency medical transportation drivers with extensive training, just like um, in the United States, how the, the Medicaid transport companies have. Uh, we set up the non-emergency medical transportation certification. We add wheelchair accessible vehicles because, of course, that is one of the the things that if there is a gap in a community, there might be a, a small business or um, a small nonprofit that's taken on part of the transportation, but often the accessible vehicles are, are harder to obtain and, and uh, pay for and manage, and so that might be lacking, so we include that full and part-time positions, and those are local drivers. So helping, you know, not bringing in someone and, and transplanting them into the community, but hiring from within so we can provide some jobs and, and be another support that way. And what this does is it really helps expand options. So if we're there to help with uh, medical care and we have these non-emergency medical transportation drivers, but they're not busy, you know, all the time with those trips, then we offer grocery and prescription delivery with those drivers and really supplement the whole transportation ecosystem. So another way that we wanna look at capacity building is sharing knowledge of funding sources and sustainability. So this is really kind of flipping the script because often nonprofits hold very, very tightly to their funding resources. And, and as a nonprofit ourselves, we totally understand this um, and know that you know, if there's no money, there's no mission. So that is important, but there are a lot of grants and federal programs, at least in the United States and, and likely in Canada, foundations and corporate sponsors where, you know, everybody can go together and share knowledge of what's going on. And uh, when you have these relationships formed through the community leadership circle and through the action teams, then we've set up an environment where we're ready to collectively apply for funding sources that can address everybody's needs and not be so guarded um, and siloed and really single focused. So it's capacity building in that way too, in this shared resource knowledge. And I'm going to turn it back over to Valerie uh, to talk about the rest of the components. So the mobility coordination is really a lot of times where people first start looking when they are saying, okay, we have a, a, a transportation barrier, we need an app. <laughs> or we need a, some type of technology. So this is a lot of times where people start and come to us um, with. And so go ahead and go to the next slide. So one of the things that we do and have done very well is put together these one call, one click stations or centers where mobility as a, as a service is really the model for connecting the public and private transportations together. This is a picture of us and some of the transit agencies in Nevada that we connected together. They have a lot of really incredible women leaders in transportation in, in their program. And so I thought that was also really cool too, because this industry in many cases is very male dominated. So it was the first time that there were more women than men in a transportation picture that I'd been in. So it, this is a shout out for all the women that are in this industry on the call today. Um, but using this mobility coordination and this technology, it enables everybody to work together. And the coordination is often supported with the local uh, public transit agency or with the local um, kind of uh, mobility management ecosystem that's in place. So for example, if they want custom reports or they want custom data from this uh, technology, we work together to bring that forward. Next slide. And so what mobility as a service looks like in a nutshell or in a diagram, if you will, is engaging public transit. If there's TNCs available, specialty transportation, volunteer drivers, taxi, small businesses, all with one data pipeline. And so as we do that across the United States, that looks a little bit different based upon where the technology is at for some of those agencies. So for example, some of the transportation providers we're working with in Nevada, they're a rural senior center. And so they say, you know, we provide adult day services and we have a vehicle and we have a van and we provide rides predominantly to and from our center. And then every now and then we help folks get to doctor's appointments or things like that. And by training them and providing that resource and putting them in the platform, the hospitals and the, the cancer centers and the employment access centers are able to go on 
online and determine if there's transportation available and, and request that ride. Even though that's a senior center and a rural senior center, 90% of the time they're driving the same passengers to and from locations, that 10% of capacity makes a big difference in that community. Go ahead, next slide. And then as data and insights, as, as we all know, every dollar that we're, we're given, whether philanthropically or from the government, um, or we raise from private business takes, it is, is very valuable and, and every dollar counts. And in some cases for every dollar, there is seven reports. And so we completely appreciate knowing about the impact that your program is making is absolutely vital. And so with this program, uh, we really look together and put together a data management approach. Many times we engage local universities, um, local uh, research entities that is trusted by the government or trusted by that agency to work together. So Phoenix is not a house full of data engineers and research analysts. We depend on local uh, research components or, or, or third parties to, but we work together to you know, understand what is the data collection process? What are we sharing? Do we have a right of authority for what are we sharing? How do we want to analyze it? And then what are we reporting? Sometimes we report quality metrics in the communities that we support with, where they want to hear stories and they want to know about what the impact. In other cases, they just want to see the the number race, what percentage of rides, how many, what percentage of new riders do we have? And so we work together to put these instruments together, how often we report them and, and allow us to be kind of the, the navigators of this process. And finally is fundraising. Um, we talk about capacity building and the mobility coordination, but then there's the fundraising element in and of itself. And so when we work in a community supporting that fundraising and needs, many times we also launch campaigns. Go ahead, next slide. And we do fundraising for individuals and families to get to essential services. So uh, one campaign that we'll have coming up here in the coastal bend of Texas, we have a partnership with the Purple Heart Veterans Association. And so can we go out and get corporate sponsors to fund transportation for veterans who have received a Purple Heart? or we're supporting cancer treatment. One of the things that we did in the state of Nevada is put together a matrix of all the transportation resources that were available, subsidy programs, if you had needed access to medical care. When we were doing that, we found seven or eight different resources that when we were talking with some of these uh, nurse navigators with the cancer treatment centers, they're like, I had no idea this program existed. And so sometimes these resources are out there and hidden in plain sight, but bringing together and putting everything on the table is very important. When we launch the Ignite program, we also wanna make sure that as part of the budget, we have ride funding for those most in need because that enables us to provide immediate impact and momentum in the community to show the impact. And like I said a little bit earlier, we also raise money on a national scale with annual campaigns and monthly giving programs that we're gonna be launching. And so we take that element that you normally would see with like Save the Children or um, the uh, so many different charities for water and saving animals. You know, I have five dogs. I love animals, but I love getting people to healthcare even more. So, so these kind of metrics and these kind of uh, mechanisms are, are part of this Ignite model. And so if you have any questions, Kate and I would love to hear them. And I, I think I saw one come in on the, um, on the chat, but uh, Nicole, please tell me what, tell us what's next. Yeah, thanks, Valerie. You're doing my job for me, and you're doing a great job. We have had two questions come in through Q&A, so I'll just fire them off to you uh, to begin. Uh, so first, it actually begins with a comment and a compliment. Amazing work. Thank you for your rich and detailed presentation from Bev Pittman of the United Way of British Columbia. The question is, has Mobility Rising been able to interest any of its partners in green solutions? For example, electric vehicles, perhaps including buses. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. So Phoenix, in a lot of the pilots that we're working on, we work with public transit agencies that are using, you know, reduced carbon buses and things like that. And we haven't actually done a pilot yet that specifically focuses on green energy. We have some proposals we're looking at, whereas part of solving the mobility ecosystem, you, you have, we have green, we have, you know, 
um, electric powered cars and we're starting charging stations. That's a huge initiative in the US is green infrastructure and with gas prices, we're all going on. How, how fast can I get my hands on one of those, those vehicles? Um, and, and how fast can we grow the electrical e electrical system. So a lot of the places that we work, unfortunately, however, the power grid is very fragile. And so we also have to be very mindful that the technology ecosystem to support under, under the ground or above in the power lines is able to hold the capacity that's necessary. But we do feel confident that that will be something that we'll be um, doing and working together. We've done some uh, consulting in collaboration with the Department of Energy and the National Energy Research Lab. Sorry, I just couldn't click my unmute there. Uh, thank you. Like you, I, I feel encouraged that we're heading towards a more uh, green sector in this way. Uh, a follow-up question uh, that came in was around uh, funding and any uh, you know, success or perhaps demonstrated appetite that you've uh, been able to see or experience from government to, uh, support to get um, public funds for the work that do. If you could speak to that, that would be wonderful. Yeah, we've received federal, several federal grants and several state grants um, in this space. And so, for example, we have a Federal Transit Administration HOPE grant, which is helping obtain prosperity for everyone is what that looks at, um, looking at addressing persistent poverty in the community of Detroit. We've received an FTA IMI, an Innovative Mobility Innovation or Integrated Mobility Innovation Award in Minnesota and a FTA Innovated Care and Access Management, um, supporting first and last mile access to care gaps in Columbia, South Carolina. And then we've got several grants and funds from the state of Wisconsin, the state of Texas and collaboration. So it definitely is something that we're very familiar with and have been successful um, at, at doing. Interesting to hear how much of it is at the state level. And I'm sure that many folks on the call were kind of feverishly writing down the, the names of the grants that you mentioned. Not that we'd be eligible for them here in Canada, but to understand, do we have something similar here? Ashlyn talked about it earlier. Funding um, can be a huge challenge for the work that we're doing. So, so thank you for responding to that. Yeah. And I think and when it comes to the funding element, one of the things, and, and this again, it goes to why we focused on Ignite about health equity, is because when you just talk about needing transportation, there's about, you know, this many grants that fund rides, hardcore rides. But when you talk about breaking, breaking down systemic barriers um, or supporting health equity for underserved communities, there's a lot bigger um, when you say pool to draw from and a lot more donors find those discussions, even though that's what you're doing, it's a ride, it's improving access to care. But when you frame it that way, it just, they seem more receptive. Thank you, I appreciate that. And appreciate all of the time um, that you've put into preparing for this, for sharing everything that you have today. Um, I know that there was so much interest to hear about your, your model and your work. And uh, we just can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us at our inaugural summit on this uh, to share the wonderful work of Phoenix Mobility Riding, uh, Rising. So thank you, Valerie and Kate, so much. We're honored to be here. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you. So to any last minute questions that come in for Valerie and Kate, please pop them in the chat. Uh, but I am going to bring us into our second award session of, uh, of the summit today. So I'm pleased to introduce two organizations who have been awarded the test category. To have a truly innovative idea is rare and it's incredible to be able to recognize two today. The South Vancouver Neighborhood House and Mount Pleasant Neighborhood House found innovation right at home. In fact, in each other's backyards, they made the creative decision to combine their services to better support their clientele. They are the uh, first of two awardees that we'll hear from in this section. And without further ado, I will turn it over to uh, Jenny Fermanek and Cam Pearson 
uh, to speak to their innovative idea. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nicole. I'm just going to try and share my screen here. How's this? Looks good. Perfect. You're off. Work. And I can. Okay, perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, so as mentioned, uh, we are looking at a collaborative approach to seniors transportation. And so this project is really a partnership between two organizations based around one program. Uh, so the South Vancouver Neighborhood House, Mount Pleasant, and a program called Better at Home that is uh, quite a uh, important program that is here in the province of uh, British Columbia. So to start, the organization that I work in is the South Vancouver Neighborhood House. Uh, our organization is rooted in community development, and we have um, literally hundreds of programs and serve the lifespan. So we have everything from uh, preschool programs, childcare, parenting, settlement, language, to a very robust seniors uh, department. Uh, our vision is that everyone in South Vancouver lives a healthy and engaged neighborhood, and our mission is that we play a leadership role in building healthy and engaged neighborhoods by strengthening people's capacity for uh, creating change. Um, so I'm going to pass it to Cam. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so my name is Cam. Uh, I work for Mount Pleasant Neighborhood House, which is uh, very similar to South Van Neighborhood House in terms of the kinds of services we offer. We're located, we're located in central Vancouver. And yeah, we strive to empower members of our communities by hosting events in groups, uh, celebrating together, engaging community members to understand how we can best support them and helping to build leaders in our community. Um, I just, uh, I can provide a, like a look, some examples of some of the work that we do. Um, so in terms of connecting, uh, we offer weekly community lunches uh, for uh, anyone in the community to come join for like a, a low cost. We also have Aboriginal family dinners uh, to connect Indigenous families in the area. Uh, for celebrating, uh, just last week we had a celebration for Eid uh, to celebrate the end of Ramadan uh, with uh, our Muslim community and our larger community as well. For engaging, we have a caretaker circle, so for uh, adults who are uh, taking care of older adults in their life and they want support from each other uh, to try and understand uh, how they can best support their loved ones, uh, we provide uh, that space for them to speak with each other and we can provide resources. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we're having a dialogue on uh, decriminalizing poverty. Uh, to uh, kind of inform our community members more about uh, the work being done for that. Uh, for leadership building, we have a, a senior men's group that I help run where we're trying to establish like a small woodworking space uh, in central Vancouver and trying to empower the men to kind of lead that project. Um, and I think uh, especially for this, uh, this project here, uh, for empowerment, we're helping our seniors live at their homes for longer uh, than they might otherwise be able to on their own. And uh, Jeannie will be able to, yep, it's, it is men's sheds. That's what we're, we're helping to, to do for the, um, our senior men. But uh, Jeannie will, help, uh, will speak more to the Better at Home program. But I think what I can, I can say about neighborhood houses and our, and our role in the Better at Home program is that because we're so connected to our community and like we're so trusted by members of our community that we really have a good, we're at a really good position to understand the kind of day-to-day -day issues that everyone in our community faces from youth to adults to seniors, newcomers to, to people who have lived here for a long time. Um, so particularly for transportation, we're quite connected to the, the struggles that uh, our seniors have had in, uh, in uh, receive in, in being transported to their various needs throughout the city, even in a city like Vancouver, uh, where the transportation is, is quite good. Um, so I think on that note, I can, I can leave the rest to Jeannie. Thank you. So the Better at Home program is a program that's funded through the provincial government of BC and managed by the United Way. So this program is really about keeping seniors living in their own homes for as long as possible by offering non-medical support services. So there are, I believe, we just had our conference uh, 
last week or the week before, and I believe there's up to 82 uh, better at home programs now in the province, and each one really does work very locally at a local level to best serve uh, their, their neighborhood. Uh, the basket of service is, it varies depending on where the program is. Uh, friendly visiting, transportation, yard work, uh, housekeeping, grocery shopping. In more northern communities, we have snow shoveling and, and actually chopping wood as well. So uh, quite a, a breadth of, of services that can be offered. Transportation is, uh, is an important, obviously, piece of Better at Home. And I just I guess I wanted to share that in Vancouver proper, so the city of Vancouver, we actually have uh, nine better at home programs and we're all working within a catchment area. So Mount Pleasant has its area and South Van has its area. So within the community-based senior services sector, we, uh, when we look at transportation, often there's two models of transportation delivery that are most common. And that is the volunteer driver program and community shuttles. And a little bit of the history of South Van's transportation program is that we started uh, with a volunteer driver program many years ago, it was probably eight or nine years ago. And, uh, and that was great. And we, we've had different iterations of transportation through over the years. Uh, through the volunteer driver program, we found that a lot of folks were using our program to go get groceries, which was wonderful. Um, but we thought, is there a way to do this more efficiently? So uh, we had a shopping shuttle that we ran twice per month that picked up groups of seniors to take them shopping. So it was um, group shopping trips. And what we found was that it was actually very social and people were riding the shopping shuttle for more than just getting groceries they might just go pick up a few things but it was the social aspect and it was getting out of their homes and you know getting getting to do a bit of traveling and get out so from that we realized well maybe we can do some trips that aren't just going to a grocery store but maybe we can do some out trips so we've also had out trips but really the the base of our, our driver program was with volunteers um with the pandemic we had to put our volunteer driver program on hold. Um, and so what had happened was we, we did have, you know, we were able to shift our funds to best support the community, which was really fantastic. So as the pandemic went on, we realized that transportation was again, becoming really important. There were many folks that were missing important uh, medical appointments and were needing to get to those and they'd been delayed. So we wanted to be able to provide transportation to the community. So because we were able to shift our funding dollars, we hired a driver and we started a bit of a community shuttle. We were also able to use our adult day programs, um, accessible minivan because they weren't using it. They were doing a lot of their programming online. So we hired a driver for three days a week and those were weekdays so that he could mainly focus on doing medical appointments um, with also the opportunity to help uh, you know, do other types of errands and rides whenever you know, we were prioritizing medical but open to any type of transportation requests. Um, so I just wanted to go back to the modes of transportation that are often uh, used to provide uh, transportation for seniors. So the first one is volunteer driver programs. Um, they both come with benefits and challenges. Volunteer driver programs are wonderful. They're very personalized. It's also a very social. Um, for programs, they're inexpensive to run. Uh, mainly it's, uh, you know, it's the mileage if it's being paid. And they're great because if you have a few keen volunteers, you can actually run a pretty successful program we found. Um, but there are many challenges as well with running a volunteer driver program. Um, there, there's a lot of admin time and coordination time. Uh, li liability and insurance can become a kind of sticking point for some. Um, in general, there can be a lack of volunteers and then more specifically, a uh, lack of volunteers that are available during office hours when those medical appointments are most often held. Um, within Vancouver, we have, we're working within catchment areas. So often uh, drivers are working in a catchment area but crossing many others to actually access the services. Volunteers are sitting idle. Uh, a lot of the time when they're waiting and there's not, we're not always able to help wheelchairs. Uh, and then also just the, you know, the trends that are happening in society. Um, I just sometimes wonder about the sustainability of volunteer driver programs, especially in large uh, urban centers where there is definitely a shift to more active types of transportation and conflicting priorities with uh, green initiatives and active transportation models where we see uh, parking 
parking is diminished. Fuel is very expensive. Uh, we have a lot more, you know, bike lanes being put in and losing um, lanes. <laughs> so just driving is becoming more difficult, especially like I mentioned in large urban center centers. Tight here. Oh, uh, as for community shuttles, uh, Sorry, they are Jeannie, fantastic. Just, um, I, I apologize to interrupt, but just to keep us time, I'm going to ask, uh, have to ask you to just wrap up in a minute or two describing okay. your service. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> so I'm not going to go through this, but community shuttles are wonderful. Also come with their pros and cons. The, the biggest challenge is they're expensive, they're expensive to run, and the access to, to vehicles can be difficult. Um, so I'm going to skip through our assumptions, but I think that they're kind of inherent through the presentation. The reason we decided to partner with Mount Pleasant is because we actually both fall under the Association of Neighborhood Houses. So we, should, we are of the same legal entity. So this makes things like liability insurance and payroll very easy to manage. And we also share a program catchment area. So the majority of the rides that South Bend does is actually traveling through Mount Pleasant's catchment area and going into their area to access the hospitals and the real um, medical corridors. So the vision is that by collaborating resources and working together, we can have a larger reach. So this looks like a hybrid model of transportation provision where we can collaborate on volunteer recruitment, engagement, and usage. We can also share resources, admin, vehicles, the cost of running the program, uh, also creating a centralized booking system that breaks down barriers to access for older adults, and then hopefully in implementing digital solutions, which we know exist, but we've never really approached that in, as far as I know, in the Better at Home programs in Vancouver. Uh, so what this means is just our, we can provide a more personalized, uh, person-centered service and, provide more services and really hopefully adapt to be able to provide not only medical, but, you know, errands and social engagements and really just improve quality of life and overall health outcomes for older adults. Thank you so much, Jeannie and Cameron, for sharing that overview of service. And I think this slide, Vision for a Future, really accurately captures all the benefits around why you would choose to, to collaborate. I think collaboration vision for the future that we should all aspire to. Um, so I'll, I'll just very quickly ask, you know, question, if you could each take 15, 20 seconds to answer, uh, just to understand what have you each found has been the biggest benefit for your organizations individually of collaborating? Um. I think I can I can maybe start. I think one of the biggest benefits is uh, just kind of uh, saving on the amount of uh, administrative time that it takes to run a program like this. Uh, like both like the South Van Neighborhood House and Mount Pleasant Neighborhood House, we do a lot of different programs, and it's just a lot of work to coordinate these very this very specialized service for seniors. And we're happy to do it, but once we realized that we were both doing uh, offering very similar services, we realized that by kind of combining services and having a more centralized coordination system that uh, we would be able to open up our capacities uh, for the kind of other programs that we help to work on and then expand our services for transportation. And Jeannie, 15, 20 seconds if you like. Yeah, I think just um, being able to provide a hybrid model where we have a paid driver that can really do specialized medical services and then you know enhancing the program with volunteers that can help with shopping and whatever else medical appointments as well but I think that you know and just the the cost of having that pay driver um, and I think being able to split that cost and share uh, again like Cam said share the admin time of the volunteer engagement the whole process uh, will just give us that much more ability to grow the program Thank you both for being here today to, to talk about that collaboration. Um, congratulations for the work that you're doing. It makes a big difference in both communities. Yeah, thank you. We're, we're thrilled and we just want to send a big shout out to Fast Track and are so thrilled to be recognized. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you both. And so excitingly, we have a, uh, another award to present at this time, or to recognize, I should say, a group by the name of Our Way Conservancy. They have looked beyond 
uh, typical vehicles like cars and buses to bring a transportation solution to their community. Um, we've spoken a lot today about transportation as a part of the aging, and I think the e-trike and e-rickshaw program that our Greenway Conservancy has proposed has taken this to a whole other level. Uh, we'll be talking about active transportation, green transportation, but I don't want to steal the floor from uh, Darnell Harris, who will tell you about it in his own words. Thank you and welcome, Darnell. Thank you very much, of course, um, for honoring the work that's being done by our Greenway as well as the Toronto Council on Aging. So, you know, certainly our practical mobility program for suburban seniors has been really, you know, the outgrowth and result of our vision in that the goal of our Greenway is to finance, program, and steward local mobility coming out of a belief that in order to be able to move forward sustainable mobility, people, be, people need to be able to have safe infrastructure they feel comfortable in, as well as the knowledge that these devices exist, as well as how to use it. And in that way, what we're seeking to do, sort of using applied research and advocacy, you know, showcasing pilots of what's possible. And this program is an outgrowth of that. You know, it's certainly one thing we found in our experience when you say you can have a bike like that, which is one of our commercial bikes, um, you could have it as opposed to showing decision makers and showing staff, we'd like to run this on these roads. And what we're really doing is sort of transforming this, the, the sense of what cycling means. So our work began in 2014, 2015, sort of with community engagement and asking, you know, what would they like to see? What would the community like to um, have? And the vision that was created effectively looked like this. You know, streets where people are buffered from traffic, you're able to have seniors all ages being able to enjoy community spaces as well as have you know vehicles in which they feel safe which is what we've represented here what we found you know in going to implement this is there were a number of great challenges if you look at the pathway there you see a number of different devices um, you know some are inexpensive in theory but impossible to get in Canada due to various legal issues and also you know the paths simply aren't wide enough because when people tend to think of cycling, it tends to come off as this sort of, uh, you know, recreational piece that is only for, for sport and only for um, a relatively narrow age group as well. However, you know, going into a work coming out of that, this is a map of, of Northwest Toronto. All the yellow here are houses. And if you notice, they have, you know, community centers um, scattered around and parks scattered around. But what you also notice is this is a very long walk. It would be very difficult for seniors certainly to get there. You know, if you take, for example, the North Kipling Community Center in the northern part of this map and the Gordon Irene Community Center, that is a good 30 minute walk um, plus, assuming the weather is good and, you know, assuming that uh, that they're healthy enough to do that. So suffice to say, you know, there are challenges for people in the community getting to potential spaces. And that's where we saw the opportunity to sort of put our beliefs and ideas into practice and, um, and make it easier for people to get around. So within this program, we've been looking at both a trike um, that, as you can see on the left, allows seniors to move and get around, um, but also having, you know, someone, someone cycling them as they sit comfortably, seat belts and such. And then also on the right, um, you see sort of our applied research approach with these tricycles, being able to get seniors to be able to ride themselves, um, who, you know, could, could be comfortable using a trike for practical purposes. Big basket in the front, can do groceries. Um, certainly comfortable, slight assist if you need it. And, you know, in this way, what we're doing is we're able to have an uh, available uh, program that was supported by funds from the government of Ontario 
but something that's also appropriate and adaptable in that wherever you are in the city or you know in the country it is possible to have a sort of cycle that can meet your needs and then work on the programming to back that up. Now, quickly, Downsview is a great case study. We've been working with, with them here in Toronto. Downsview is a federal park, um, one of the few sort of a national, a national sites. And as you can see, there is, you know, it's not a completely um, flat piece of land. There are a number of hills and, and terrain around there, but it's a beautiful way to spend some time. However, um, you know, in comes sort of the the trike that we have. The one on the left is is one of our one of our trikes. It's a Van Ram Chat, comes from the Netherlands. Uh, this one on the right here is the Nehola. It's the bike I was speaking of. The seniors can ride themselves, and both of these cycles have the benefit of being able to allow people to comfortably, you know, effectively age in place by being able to get out, have exercise, either by doing it themselves or by uh, having you know, someone able to come pick them up. Some of the advantages of these approaches in particular is that one, you know, you're reducing costs because these sort of cycles are lower cost to run and maintain, and therefore you can plow that into, into other parts of the program. So going back to Downsview for a second and just showing you know, some of the practical advantages of doing this, that's a circuit path around and it would take you about you know, eight minutes maybe because we'd go a little slower um, than, than Google suggests, probably closer to around 10 to 12. Meanwhile, it would take 32 minutes to walk. And that's why most people don't walk around the park um, because there can be, you know, as you can see, their elevation changes and it would certainly not be easy for a senior to, to walk that three kilometers. So in this way, we're able to uh, give people accessibility around the space. And, you know, we're going to be, um, again, with some help, further help we got from Canada Summer Jobs, we'll be running a pilot um, piece, taking people around the park and area this summer. Now, you know, I'm sure the question is going to come up, but what about winter now? Um, there are challenges and solutions to that. One being, you know, the bikes are equipped to be able to have uh, comfortable blankets in front. So you're able to, you know, keep warm as you go along the pathway. And certainly they can handle a certain amount of ice and snow. Um, however, on the right, you can see sort of what the pathways look like. Uh, when, you, when you enter this pathway, which as you can see, is still well walked through even in winter, um, a City of Toronto sign cheerfully tells you there's no winter maintenance, just in case you were wondering. And certainly, you know, part of what we're doing with our Greenway and the point of having a conservancy is to be able to say, no, people are having these pathways. And a lot of what we're trying to do here is say, you know, um, you don't just need to clear them in, in the summer because people are walking and biking for exercise. But these are actually mobility routes, and we're bringing seniors down these routes. And we would like to do this. On, a, on an ongoing basis. And so, you know, from the conservancy side, as part of that applied approach, we're saying we'd like to be in charge of managing and restoring this. So, you know, there's no reason you can't use, this, use these cycles and this approach year round as long as the paths are safe and clear. And that's just a matter of having the right rate. Hi, Darnell. Oh, perfect. You've landed right where, uh, right where I wanted to take us. Thank you so much. I'll, uh, I'll give you the floor for another uh, couple seconds, and then we did have a question I wanted to pose. Sure. Um, yeah, no, just want to throw a shout out to Plug and Drive, um, the Electric Vehicle Discovery Center. And, you know, when we spoke with them, we said, look, you know, I know you deal with cars, but we're electric vehicles too. And it's, it's really important that people get the sense of, of what's possible because these sort of cycles definitely allow people to be much more mobile at the age. Thank you very much, Nicole. Thank you. And the question that's come in is actually to clarify whether the vehicles that you've been describing in your pilot, are they permitted on uh, public roads, Toronto city streets, for example? Yes, they are certainly um, permitted on public roads. They do fit in bike lanes, barely so, I, I will fully admit. 
And certainly, I, I will say though, it's that you know usually when you speak about road construction, it um, staff or staff from from different cities will tell you yes, you know a single bike, two wheel bike can fit in there. It's not a problem. But when you you know you cheerfully go back and say look yes we'll be running a seniors program on this road with 18 wheelers and you'll we'll be taking this bike in um suddenly there's a different you know sense and standard of safety which they hold on wait a second we didn't know you were going to use that but i said well it's perfectly safe you know you built the road <laughs> you know and and that's sort of um but that's the way that we conduct advocacy because unless we show the case we found um it can be difficult for people to understand and believe it and, and generally you know the way that we approach it is the way people approach the road and that the point of a road is that everyone can use it as a pathway for people the bike path has been traditionally seen as for those other people as an amenity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to a practical place where, you know, um, I'm carrying loads. So the bike is a yeah. bike at the beginning, um, these bikes as well. So what we're saying is, you know, with the types of cycles that do exist and we have, there's a larger scope and understanding of what should be. Yeah. Thank you. It, um, it, your response really, um, uh, you know, proves the point that, um, there needs to be a shift in mindset sometimes to bring these solutions to the forefront. So Darnell, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for sharing uh, your, your pilot. I know the area well, so when I'm down that way, I will look for your vehicles uh, on the pathways and congratulations again to our Greenway Conservancy. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you um, for the recognition help page. And certainly uh, when you're down, we're more than happy to give you a ride. Looking forward to it. Cheers. Well, for the next part of our summit, I am um, I, I'm pleased to introduce someone who is going to be able to share from the passenger perspective. That has been at the heart so much of uh, what we've been talking about, but also the pedestrian perspective. Mary Wilson is our next speaker. She has earned herself the nickname Multimodal Mary for all the ways she chooses to commute which have only been expanding over the years. Mary resides in New Westminster, Z, and she's been a tireless advocate for seniors for over 20 years, particularly in the areas of transportation, and as I mentioned, bringing the voice of pedestrians forward in transportation planning. So here to share her lived experience with us, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, is Mary Wilson. Thank you and welcome, Mary. Mary, if you're chatting, we still have you on mute. So bottom left, there should be the option to enable your microphone. Yep. Um, and just beside that, to enable your video as well. Gotcha. Thank you. Perfect. Welcome. Thanks, Nicole. <laughs> um, I, feel like, I feel like something of an anomaly here uh, in a number of ways. Uh, first of all, with status, I am a senior. And in fact, I'm a senior senior. I'm well past my um, initial retirement age. I have been in retirement for over 20 years now. After a successful 40 year career path, which had nothing whatsoever to do with transportation. And uh, I was, I, I, in, during my retirement 20 years, I have built a second career path for transportation advocacy as a volunteer, not as a paid person, and I've been quite successful. So I was invited today to talk about seniors transportation, which of course I can do because I am a senior, and to share my experiences about my transportation advocacy career path since I retired. I don't have a title for this presentation and I don't have slides either. <laughs> so I will, low technology, I will hold up something if I want you to see it. Um, and the, the, the one theme that it will come back time and again in my presentation is change. How we perceive it, how we deal with it. And I think that's tied in with the theme that you have here for innovation. Okay, how did I get, I'll be quick. Past present and future. How I got started on my path of transportation advocacy. When I retired 20 years ago, 
just about the same time our provincial ministry of transportation announced that they were going to close a crosswalk well so you say so no big deal well it was a big deal for me and it was a big deal for me because that crosswalk was part of a 20 kilometer pedestrian and bicycle route that went right through the lower mainland it was described in the media as one of the best biking and hiking routes in the lower mainland and the ministry intended to cut it because they were building a new bridges and roads and they did not want to impede traffic flow trucks and cars were not to stop or slow down because a pedestrian wanted to cross the roads or get rid of the crosswalk and that's the small but powerful roots of my 20-year transportation advocacy pathway such a small thing but it started a whole <laughs> a whole history so what did i do when i heard about the, the crosswalk being closed i could have i could have raised a little hell but um instead i i approached the city and i applied for a seat in on the one of the city's advisory committees they had a number of them and the Pedestrian and Bicycle Advisory Committee was a transportation committee. So I, I was accepted and I sat on that committee for several years. There were times when I felt like the only voice in New Westminster that was advocating for pedestrians. There was not a, a, a lot of, there were not a lot of people aspiring to speak up for pedestrians. And, and, and if, I, <laughs> if you got me diverted, I could talk a whole lot on that topic. But, but over those 20 years of transportation, as Nicole said, I've become known as multimodal Mary. That's because I have always used multiple ways of getting around the city. And remember, I'm living in an urban area. It's not the same as um, people who are living in rural areas, but living in an urban area, I could do this. Um, I, have, um, I have a transit card, compass we call it in the lower mainland, gets me on the bus, gets me on the sky train, gets me on the ferry to North Vancouver. And with that trunk, that compass card, I can go anywhere all over the lower mainland. I ride a bike, a regular bike. I drive a car and I love my car. On my driver's license, there used to be three um, classes. There was a class four, which was the regular license, a class five, which is a professional driver's license, and a class six, which is a motorcycle license. I don't ride a motorbike anymore. Um, but but I, the main thing is I walk, and I walk as much as possible. <laughs> I could have become an advocate for any of those modes that I've just mentioned. So why would I choose to advocate, end up advocating for walking? Well, walking is a transportation mode. And it's one that's universal, it's convenient, it's interesting, it's healthy, it's versatile, and it's old technology, one foot in front of the other. It's the first transportation mode we acquire as humans, and it's very often the last one that we lose. And, and as I said, it works for me because with my compass card in hand, I can access almost any place in the lower mainland and then go walking. Maybe I chose to be an advocate for walker because they're the underdogs in transportation. Walking is very often not acknowledged as a transportation mode. And it has a long history of not receiving equity consideration in the world of transportation. It's very difficult to find people who will advocate for pedestrians. So there's multimodal Mary emerging as a persistent, although often alone voice. My timing was great for doing this because change was happening. There was becoming a few, several years ago, a rising tide of interest in creating walkable cities and promoting urban walking. And behind that, of course, was the climate change and the environmental stuff and health issues. All of those things were pushing that wave higher. And I was able to ride the wave. It wasn't because I was unusually successful. It was because I was, timing was right. And eventually, that rising wave brought on board a few other residents and in 2016 we formed a pedestrian advocacy group you can probably see that we called it the walkers caucus we <laughs> we, we 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 don't say the third word which is the raucous walkers caucus but we've been active and we've been very vocal since then and we, we have had successes we've become known in new westminster and not many cities have an active pedestrian advocacy group it doesn't happen 
we have brought James walks to New Westminster. We have beautified the areas for pedestrians by having artistic mosaics in the sidewalk. We have a annual challenge with neighboring municipalities to for walking. It's ending this week, and I bet you about New Westminster will win the prize again. Um, and and I'll tell you, one year I was nominated for pedestrian of the year in New Westminster, and I'm proud of that. And that was for my walking advocacy activities. So, um, I, um, but I wasn't a typical senior when it comes to transportation. I'd been taking it for granted that I'd sail through my senior years with my car, my bike, my transit pass, and my own two feet. Then we had COVID. That was a big issue for seniors. And for me, as a senior senior, I could no longer take for granted my freedom to roam on transit. I experienced con transportation constraints and some social isolation, and I felt very vulnerable, as did many seniors in my, in my category. So you, you may have seen this brochure, when is it time to hang up the keys? That for me became a metaphor for dealing with change. And it's not just changes in transportation. I, I don't know if any of you have read that new book by Andre Picard about COVID and long-term care homes, scared the daylights out of a lot of seniors. Where are we going to live as we get older? And so like many seniors, COVID had me thinking about the need to plan for where and how I could age in place in my neighborhood, in my community, in my own home. And in conjunction with where I live in the future, I needed to plan for changes in mobility, how I will get around in my city, in my neighborhood, in my community as I get older. So I have become much more sensitive to transportation for seniors. And that's ironic. <laughs> it opened up a whole new perspective on, 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 uh, on, on seniors' uh, transportation because my 20 year pedestrian advocacy pathway which has been riding the wave has become a bit of a parabola it's going downhill and i have so many questions still to ask and issues still to deal with but i'm transitioning the topics that are on my mind and that definitely need the work i have a colleague pardon me in that in the walkers caucus he's very much involved with crosswalk timing for seniors corner cut downs for seniors all that kind of stuff me I'm really interested in the expansion of public transportation, especially what happened to Greyhound. I miss Greyhound so much for going and visiting my friends in other communities. E-mobility, the stuff that Darnell was just talking about, that's really exciting, especially for seniors. A huge hazard, but a huge potential benefit. The New Westminster just published its draft e-mobility strategy, and I'll give you one sentence quote. Looking to 2050, it is anticipated the transportation landscape is expected to evolve dramatically. I agree with that, and I think it will evolve dramatically on technology. I want, I, mean, I know there are hazards, but I want one. I want one of those little machines that I can ride around in. And, 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 and do they work on roads? The, the, the ministry in British Columbia is, re, is writing, pre, rewriting the Provincial Motor Vehicle Act in order to deal with all these new forms of e-mobility that are showing up on the sidewalks. You know, you can ride bikes, electric bikes on the sidewalk in New Westminster. That's insane for seniors. Anyway, um, Metro 2050 is a Metro Vancouver regional growth strategy planning document. And it's currently in process because they're anticipating another million residents by 2050. Transportation is a big issue in this, in this strategy. And you know the demographics, you know that the population, the, the percentage of seniors in the population is going to grow. It's not just providing the services for them, it's how are you going to engage them? How are you going to get them to be represented, especially the senior seniors? How are you going to keep them walking as long as they possibly can, if it's only to the nearest transit stop? So what you could do? You could promote and support a pedestrian advocacy voice in your particular community. Pedestrians are nowhere near as organized as bikes, but their voice is essential, especially for seniors. I feel like Alice in Wonderland sometimes. If you ever read the book, Alice in Wonderland, I feel like I'm running like hell just to stay in the same place. <laughs> there are many emerging issues and there's work to be done and there's a real need to ensure that the voice of seniors is captured, it's included, and it's heard. Over to you. Thank you.
Mary, thank you. Thank you for sharing your story, for your leadership in this area, uh, for the message of change. We have a lot of folks from BC with us today, so I think they'll be looking out for the raucous walking caucus. And uh, from what I've seen in this chat, I think you are going to find yourself with uh, requests for many more speaking engagements. <laughs> But truly, we so appreciate you taking the time to join us today at our inaugural summit. Um, and I know that you're receiving uh, virtual accolades and a round of applause. We appreciate your time again. So we are heading into the very last section of our summit uh, today. We have two more awards to give out. I've not done my job as MC. I've let time get away from us a little bit. So just as a quick update from, for everyone, we will have 10 minutes for each of our next awardees. It'll bring us right to the end of the um, uh, time allotted for the summit, 2.30 uh, p.m. Eastern. And then we'll just you know, very quickly thank everyone after that. So without further ado, uh, final two awardees to recognize today, one each in test and scale. Both of these organizations have one thing in common. While transportation may have been a challenge, they recognized that they are rich in resources and they asked themselves how they can harness those resources to the benefit of the full community. So first we are going to hear from Ask Friendship Society to share their test idea for an affordable bus program. Following Granal Transportation, uh, will share how they scaled an existing service to effectively leverage close-knit uh, communities and um, organizations within those communities to keep seniors connected and provide a healthy food during the pandemic. So first, welcome to uh, Miranda Haley from Ask French Society and congratulations. Thank you, Nicole. I'm just gonna turn my video on here. Okay, I can't turn my video on. Anyways, ASK is an adult day program. Oh, there we go. ASK is an adult day program. So about 85% of our clients um, have some form of dementia. Um, and the average age is 85 years old. We have in-person programs along with virtual programs since the pandemic. And we do a fresh meal delivery program. Um, during COVID, our buses sat idle for over two years. Um, so out here in rainy Vancouver after the two years it was beginning our buses were becoming green and I think there were frogs growing on top. Um, we've now since cleaned them up and ready to have them in use again. Um, both our buses, one is a nine passenger, one's an 18 passenger bus, both wheelchair accessible. Our buses are underutilized even before COVID they were underutilized. We'd only use them a few days a week um, for outings such as scenic drives, picnics, lunches out or local day trips. So our vision is to rent out buses to other organizations that align with our mission and vision and that have transportation needs. Our idea is to research and develop a program to rent our buses to others while being covered by insurance and liability. So our approach is that we own the buses, employ the drivers on contract and rent to organizations at an affordable rate. Um, we have been approached by many organizations over the years um, who want to rent our bus. Um, this has been kicking around our organization for over eight years now, and we've not had the resources to get this going. Um, the amin cost, um, the cost of getting contracts drawn up, um, the cost of insurance, um, even the time to get all our insurance questions answered. So um, we've been talking to local organizations who are also applying to grants to be able to afford to rent our buses. So it's good. we're coming full circle here. Um, so one of our, one of the major problems in our community is the ability and access to rent a wheelchair accessible bus, even for a day or for outings. Um, a lot of the care facilities um, would like to rent buses to get their seniors out and about who are um, stuck inside most of the time. So um, we would like to offer that to other organizations. 
So our biggest cost is, of course, the insurance, the maintenance, the gas. And if we're only using this two or three times a week, um, the rest of the time the bus is sitting idle. So it's just not being benefited. So we'd like to offer this to the community and it would benefit both parties as we would help cover some of our costs. Um, so for many, or, or, and we'd also like to present a model that other organizations can use. And if we figure out some of the problems, they can you know, borrow some of our resources and then they could duplicate this model and make it more efficient so they're not reinventing the wheel. So the biggest thing is we want to make this affordable to other organizations. Um, also, our buses have been custom designed with lowering steps, um, yellow strips for visual impairment, um, seat belts, and a microphone system for the hearing impaired. So our bus is very appropriate for seniors and the, their needs. Um, so one concern moving forward with this is the insurance and insurance premium. So we're working with another organization that has actually found a solution, solution to this. And they've been very helpful. We met with them last week and they're giving us some guidance in how to approach the insurance issues. And another roadblock we're having is looking for available trained drivers. Um, here in BC, we need an unrestricted class four license. And a roadblock is there are not a lot of people that have this type of license. Um, so I would like to actually take this opportunity to shout out to see if anybody has ideas of where to find drivers. Um, and if you have any ideas, just if you could contact me, I'll put my information in the chat. Um, and yeah, reach out if you have any ideas, information, um, any solutions, any information that we can help move this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda, for sharing a concept that I think has so much potential to make impact in, in your community and others. The question that we have for you is, um, what is the local landscape? Who are the local organizations that will stand to benefit the most uh, if this concept can get uh, off the ground and on the road, so to speak? So we're looking at local organizations. We're actually part of the West End Seniors Hub. Um, there's Red Residence Association. Um, I think there's neighborhood houses. Um, something called Brock House, which is more of a seniors group. Um, they don't have buses. They don't own buses. They have, they'd like to do day trips and um, they've approached us to rent the bus. Um, so one of the other things we've been approached about um, with the disasters in BC this year, the forest fires, we were actually approached to rent our buses to help evacuees um, from the forest fires from the interior. They would fly them into Vancouver and they wanted to rent our buses to get them to the care homes in the local areas. So those are the types of rental systems we want to want to establish and um, along with the care homes um, you know if you have a coordinator at the care homes they can book our bus book a driver and they can take 18 passengers for a scenic drive go out for the afternoon um, some because some of these people in care homes don't get out maybe they don't have family um, I've driven our bus many times and I've taken um, clients to different areas of Vancouver that they haven't seen in 30 40 years and they love seeing the changes in the city and what, you know, even we've gone back past um, old houses that they used to live in. Just that experience of getting out and about. Thank you, Miranda. I, I think that response just, it puts into focus the potential impact of this, uh, the importance of collaboration. Again, a recurring theme throughout, uh, throughout our summit. So thank you so much. And I've seen the chat uh, it looks like you might have some leads, so uh, to be continued. Okay, great. Thank you. Wonderful. And I will now turn the floor to uh, Wendy Curtis, who will talk about uh, their Grand Isle Transportation Service, as I mentioned, that they were able to effectively uh, scale during COVID-19. Last year alone, they completed over 1,100 trips to support their community. We look forward to hearing from you in person, Wendy. The floor is yours.
Thanks. Now I do have some slides. Here we go. So, okay, the next slide, please. Um, so I'm Wendy Curtis. I'm the program coordinator for the Better at Home program in Grand Isle. And uh, Jeannie did a good job of describing uh, what Better at Home is. Um, one of the key components of our service for Better at Home is transportation. Um, and we've been told by the, the clients of Better Home that of all, all the services we provide, transportation is the most significant to them. Next slide. So just to give you an idea where we are located, we are a rural remote community. We're North Central British Columbia. That's us with the yellow star. Um, we are 50 kilometers from the main highway, which is Highway 16. It is a secondary road. And um, all of our services that people need to, to access are located in those red pin dots. So we have Burns Lake, Houston, and Smithers. So it is a significant distance from us. We do not have a grocery store or government services besides the village office. So people do have to travel. Um, to access services. And that's been a big issue for a number of years. Next slide. So here's the distances people do travel. Um, we were able to obtain funding in 2017 through the Ministry of Transport and Infrastructure Highway 16 Community Transportation Grant to purchase a vehicle. It's a, a nine passenger van. Um, and initiate our service. We travel to Burns Lake on Tuesdays, Houston's on Wednesdays, and uh, Smithers on Thursdays. The cost for a trip is $10 round trip, uh, but tr travel is free for seniors. Um, the Better Home Program subsidizes that travel. And we, the specific reason the bus was initially purchased was to take people for medical appointments, but it quickly became apparent that it was needed for grocery shopping, banking, shopping in general, and to access the government services that aren't available here. Uh, next slide, please. And we're also able to use the bus for other needs besides transporting people. Um, two programs that I ran, uh, one was the Lakes District Arts Count Council Concert Series. Um, which is ran in Burns Lake. And we took seniors to uh, concerts, um, a ballet, and um, different events put on by the council. We also ran Choose to Move, which is an activity program for seniors. And we used the bus to take us through uh, different communities for swimming, bowling, and for lunch. And these were the pre-pandemic times. So uh, next slide. When um, COVID hit, um, of course, ridership was greatly reduced, but, but, and people started isolating, particularly seniors, or really reduced the um, amount of travel they were doing and quickly became apparent that food security was becoming an issue. Um, seniors weren't going out to grocery shop. Our little corner store was basically like that. It was you know, very small with food resources. So we were able to coordinate quite easily with grocery stores in Burns Lake and Houston to develop a program where seniors could order their groceries over the phone, pay by credit card or gift card, and then the bus would go pick up the groceries and deliver them directly to the senior's home. And we also did that with prescriptions, because once again, the major drug stores are outside the community. We do have a little one here. Um, but for people who are, who are comfortable with their own drug store, uh, we were able to pick up their prescriptions also, as long as they're prepaid. And of course, with food security comes eating healthy. And uh, we were able to secure funding through the um, emergency grant um, by Northern United Way of the North and developed a healthy eating lunch program in collaboration with the local restaurant and the senior association and delivered, used the bus to deliver a healthy lunch every Monday 
um, and to about 30 seniors who were isolating at home. This also gave an opportunity uh, by the bus driver to do a quick check-in uh, with seeing how they were doing. And he's able to report back to me if there was any issues or uh, concerns on his part. Um, okay, next slide, please. So we did a study about the impact of um, the Better Home program um, with our seniors. And of course, transportation was one of the things they really identified with. And we initially thought it was just about providing rides, but really it was a bigger than that. Um, one of the chief concerns for seniors travel in the North and rural area is safety. Um, our road, um, is heavily used by logging trucks and industry. Um, so they were concerned about being able to drive safely on the road and particularly during winter conditions. So now they had a service where they felt very comfortable with the bus driver's ability um, to get them to their places and they didn't have to worry about driving in the winter. There was also the financial um, aspect. So we have very uh, several low, well, the majority of our seniors are low income. So the price of maintaining a vehicle, of paying for fuel uh, is a huge concern. So a trip that now is fully subsidized for them, um, relieves them of that worry and puts more money in their pockets to cover um, particularly their food costs and their heating bills up here. The other thing is independence. Um, before we had the bus service, seniors were highly reliant on their neighbors, their friends for rides or to pick up the groceries for them. Um, and that weighed heavily on them. They felt um, an obligation to return things, favors in some ways. So with this independence, they can um, either order the groceries themselves now or go to town and pick them up themselves. They can, um, go out for lunch if they want to town. Um, they can travel when they want and they can book their appointments when they want because they know the schedule and um, don't have to rely on the schedule of other people to get them to their appointments. And we were really surprised by how many social connections were developed um, on the bus. It was surprising for a small town with so few people um, we were told many times that they were meeting people on the bus that they had never seen before. And developing that social connection, they knew names, they could say hi when they're on the street. Uh, one woman told me that she met a lady who lives two houses down the street that she had never talked to before. And now they travel quite regularly on the bus and they've developed uh, connections. And a big one is peace of mind. They now know they have of transportation available to them. Um, if for some reason they can't drive, they can have the bus. If they have to give up their license for whatever reason, they know they can stay in community and still um, have the transportation needs met. And I'll just end with a couple of quotes that uh, we were given in our interviews. One is, I now feel better about being in the community. This bus is a good, good, is a godsend. We can go to our appointments, medical exams, and just for lunch. It makes it much better to live knowing look here, knowing we have transportation available. And uh, when I asked one fellow, you know, what did, you know, what did he think about the socialization? And he says, you know what, we have a lot of fun on the bus. <laughs> so. Thank you so much, Wendy. I, I love when things end on an upbeat note like that. Um, we are right up against our time, but I, I want to uh, make sure there is a chance to just answer one question that has come in. It's to ask, it, to acknowledge what you've done is difficult to deliver this consistent type of transportation in a rural and remote community. And would mm -hmm. you have any tips for communities looking to do something similar to what you're doing? Well, you know, securing funding was the huge thing. And also then um, really knowing the needs of the community, what type of uh, transportation vehicle was required. 
and how to actually, when we first started out, we thought, well, we'll charge a certain price to recover costs and that wasn't gonna work. People couldn't afford that. So we had definitely realized that to keep it affordable and to make it accessible, you have to keep the costs low and it has to be subsidized. So um, Better at Home subsidizes all the seniors for our portions of this bus. Um, but we also listen to the seniors of what they want. So we are able to individualize the travel. They go from their house to their appointments and they're picked up again. Um, so really just understanding their needs and listening to them. And then um, with a small service like this, we're really easy to adapt to their needs. Thank you, Wendy, and congratulations again to uh, yourself, the Village of Granell, for your work. Thank you for being with us today Thank and you. for leading us to the close of our uh, first ever uh, National Summit on Seniors Transportation. Um, it has been a very full summit, and so we're right up against our time. I'm, I'm going to do my wrap up very quick. I'll then pass uh, to Laura and Gregor uh, for final parting words for us. But the level of engagement has been incredible. It speaks to the need for this to continue. Uh, so thank you to all our attendees. Um, thank you to the summit uh, team, to the fast track team for the work this year. And I'd like to end by uh, bringing it back to the project that led to this summit. FAST is an acronym. It stands for Funding Accelerator for Seniors Transportation. And Accelerator speaks to the urgency with which we need to address this issue that is challenging seniors' mobility across the country. Um, so thank you for being a part of the conversation today. That's all from me. Gregor, parting words from you in a minute or two, please. Um, and then uh, over to Laura Tamblin watts Sorry, isn't it Laura first? Oh, pardon or? me. Yeah, I'm staying at the end of my three hours. Sorry, Laura, I've got it out of order here. Not a problem. Thanks very much, everyone. We've been so excited to partner together with the three organizations to address that issue that we always just sort of toss our hands up and shunt in the corner and to try to actually find replicable processes that can make transportation more a part of our age inclusive Canada. So thank you for your inspiring comments today. We laughed, we cried, we appreciated in particular some of Mary's comments and some of the real inspiration that we got in moving forward. Thank you very much on behalf of CanAge, and I'll turn it over to Gregor. Thank you, Laura. And again, thank you to all. You know, I just couldn't help but thinking throughout this uh, program that, you know, a, a community for all people means accessible transportation for all people. A community for all people means transportation for all people. You know, and I just, I know we're going to get there because it's true. It's less about creating something new as much as it is revealing what is true and what is needed of what all Canadians want, uh, communities for all people. And it's, you know, we're going to get there and we, we will get to the place where we can't even imagine it was ever otherwise. So thank you to all for being with us today, our amazing partners at CanAge and O'Hara Aging and Accessibility, our donors and our many communities who submitted their transportation solutions and to all of the people and communities across Canada who are volunteering or working hard to make transportation for all people, the truth of their community. Thank you very much.